Please come to order. The 2022 annual meeting, town meeting is now back in session. Just a couple of things. Um, we do have to complete our business tonight, no matter how long we need to be here, because we do not have sound or voting for tomorrow. Um, I did have one sad piece of news that I wanted just to make you aware of, and that is that um, Dwight Holmes, the husband of our town clerk, passed away this morning. So um, after a long illness, as a result, you will not see Nancy at the, at the front table tonight. Um, so we left off last night at Article 44. Um, before we start, I have a few pieces of information to share with you. Um, a number of people have withdrawn, um, their, have asked to withdraw their call of certain articles. And, oh, wait. Okay, sorry. So here they are. And if anyone wants to step into the shoes of these people, um, let me know. Uh, the first is Article 44. Okay. The second, I believe, is Mr. Allerhand here? Yes. And you do want to withdraw. Okay, so Article 45. I guess it would be helpful if I told you what these things were, wouldn't it? Okay, so 44 was a map change, R1 to R5 Limited, um, Red Mill Lane, Old Farm Road, Old Mill Court, Mill Hill Lane, Cato Lane, and Vesper Lane. 45 is a map change, RC to CN on Washington Street. Article 57, is a bylaw amendment swimming pool residential. Article 63, which I mentioned had been withdrawn last night, but I didn't vote on it because it never worked out to do that, it is a map change LUG2 to R5 or CN44 Skyline Drive. And Article 76, Community Housing Bank Real Estate Transfer Fee. So, yes. You want to withdraw your call of 62? Okay. And is that Ms. Bunting? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, does anyone want to be heard on Article 45, 57? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll do it in order. 44, 45, 57, 62, 63, or 76? Um, I see a hand up in the back, yes? Excuse me? Yes? You want, to, you want to pick up 76, Campbell? Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So we're going to, I'm going to recognize, oh, yeah, you gotta, you gotta yell it out. And you know, the thing to do, thank you. Yeah, the polite thing to do is to yell out, and I'll just go through this again. When you want to get my attention, Stand up and say, Madam Moderator, and then you can yell out whatever the thing is you want to yell out at me. And I pretty much try to pay attention to that, although not all the time. 
Okay, so which one was that? Number 57, and can I have your name, please? Okay. So, I'm going to recognize Denise Cronow, the chair of the Finance Committee, for the purpose of making the following motion. Move that the following articles be voted as recommended and or amended by the Finance Committee or as recommended and or amended by the Planning Board as printed in the Finance Committee report with amendments brought forward during the course of the meeting, 44, 45, 62, and 63. So moved, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? second. Motion is made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I think we are ready for a vote. Yeah, is there a point of order? 57 has now been picked up by um, uh, Mr. Mead. So the ones we're withdrawing are 45, 44, 45, 62, and 63. Okay. Here's a little known fact that I learned today, much to my horror. There's a 10 second delay in what I say here to when it's heard in the gym. So um, you may see that there's a little lag in our voting, but, and that's why. Ready? Ready. Voting is now open. Yes is one. Two is no. A yes vote will adopt this motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. And this motion does require a two-thirds vote. Voting is now closed. On that motion, yes, 371, no, 19. That motion is adopted. OK. So what does it all mean? <laughs> I think it means that we're going to Article 50. Article 50 is on page 68 of the warrant, continues to page 69. On to page 70. I'll ask for your unanimous consent to waive the reading of the motion. I'm just noting that the Planning Board and Finance Committee comments are not part of the motion. I recognize Mr. Trudell, Chair of the Planning Board, for the purpose of making the Planning Board's motion as printed in the warrant. So moved, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. That motion is made and seconded. Now, this is the first zoning article that we're going to do that only requires a majority vote due to the Housing Choice Act, just so you know. Um, Ms. Sutton has brought this forward, and I think we're just going to go right to your amendment, Ms. Sutton. 
Ms. Sutton is asking to amend the planning board's motion as follows. Under section 2A, it will now read a garage apartment not exceeding 650 square feet of gross floor area in the R5 and R10 districts and not exceeding 900 square feet of gross floor area in the R20, R40, LUG1, LUG2, and LUG3 districts. And then under 2B, the last sentence will now read, the ground cover of the existing building shall not increase more than 650 square feet in the R5 and R10 districts and not more than 900 square feet in the R20, R40, LUG1, LUG2, and LUG3 districts. And the dwelling shall not contain more than 650 square feet of gross floor area in the R5 and R10 districts and not more than 900 square feet of gross floor area in the R20, R40, LUG1, LUG2, and LUG3 districts. And under section C, that section will now read, a detached building containing not more than 650 square feet of ground cover and not more than 650 square feet of gross floor area in the R5 and R10 districts and not more than 900 square feet of gross floor area in the R20, R40, LUG1, LUG2, and LUG3 districts. Is that your motion, Ms. Sutton? Okay, if you could get to a microphone. Is there a second? Motion is made and seconded. Ms. Sutton. Hi, can you hear me? No. Okay, is that better? Yeah, just step no. right into it. Is that it. better? Yes. Okay, lean right into it. No, that's right. not good. That's not good? That's better, but. Right here, there okay, you go. how's that? That's good. We're there, all right. Okay, so, um, not quite sure where to start, but I do have several concerns about going to 900 square feet for a tertiary, which again is a third dwelling unit on a property, especially in the smaller 5,000, 10,000 square foot um, districts. Uh, so one, I feel like a 650 square foot um, tertiary dwelling is sort of um, playing towards the single or maybe the couple or maybe a, a parent with a child or something like that. So essentially two individuals, whereas I think when you get into the 900 square feet, in other words, 250 square feet more, you're looking at having four people um, in that third dwelling unit. And my concern, and people have heard me say this before, in the R5 and R10 districts is we're really jamming a whole lot of people. I don't want to get into using a word like density, but we're fitting a whole lot of people into a very small area, which already in most of these districts, the um, square footage is taken up by a primary dwelling or a duplex or um, you know a duplex with a tertiary, and it's really a building and a parking lot. And so, I feel 650 square feet is sufficient in those areas to meet the needs um, of, I think um, it was brought up by the housing trust maybe or someone with affordable housing. I think that the 650 square feet really does provide um, appropriate space for folks that may qualify for it. Um, Whereas in the larger districts, if you've got, you know, half an acre or R20, R40, and the larger districts, I feel like 900 square feet is fine because you have room to move. I think we sort of forget sometimes how important it is to mental health for people to have room to breathe. And in urban environments where um, populations are very tightly packed in, humans are very tightly packed in. I think it leads to very negative mental consequences and behavioral consequences. And while we are going in more of an urban direction in terms of our population and um, district sizes, I still think we need to be um, cognizant of the needs of the people actually living within these structures. Um, on another uh, concern of mine is that 
In terms of affordability, I myself was a single parent, sole supporting with two children. So I'm, I'm very aware of the needs and the concerns of affordability. However, 900, 250 um, square feet more only means more expense, so therefore greater cost, greater cost to heat, greater cost to electrify. And I feel like the people we're trying to serve with these um, uh, affordable and workforce housing are people that really need us to be thinking about that kind of thing. I mean, $1,800 for one bedroom seems to me like really expensive. And if I had to pay for utilities on top of it and I had to support a child, I'd really be beyond myself. So in this current climate of um, building costs, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, are through the roof, and I just don't see where that added square footage is going to benefit those who are going to be in the R5 and R10. Also, on another quick note, in terms of our carbon footprint, I think we really need to start thinking a little bit more about um, quantities of materials and our consumption. We have nothing on this island but water. Everything else comes from the other side over the water. And that's a huge carbon footprint. And I think we just need to, you know, start putting that on our radar and how we might, instead of trying to build a dam, you know, that's 10 feet high to keep the water out, how we might make some motions in a direction that would help reduce our carbon footprint, our carbon load on um, the overall system, uh, global system. So anyway, there goes my time. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Mr. Trudell. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, my, Madam Moderator. Um, We're not really I'd hearing like you. Respect from you got to get closer. you got to turn it on, one or the other. Or both. Hello? Oh, there we go. Okay, um, Cam, first I'd like to just say thank you very much for being concerned and bringing some really valid points. Um, I would like to respectfully degree, disagree with some of the things you were saying. Uh, I've had numerous times where I've had to vote down at the planning board uh, people looking to add 900 square feet, um, buildings that they hope to put another bedroom in to add that extra 300 square feet for an, another bedroom, which actually would help affordability uh, because they weren't just a family having to uh, pay what you're looking at as far as expenses. They were two separate people. It gives a little bit more quality of life. I actually had to turn down the Boys and Girls Club that still haunts me to this day because it's such a great organization and they came to us uh, wanting to expand the basement. And I just was very firm if we want to improve the quality of life and the size of the tertiary dwellings, then we need to change it at town meeting. So this is the time where you know, if we don't accept the um, 900 square foot improvement and we vote it down, I'm going to continually vote it down when somebody comes to us with uh, something that me is, is outside the box. Um, when we look at, excuse me, we had meetings we had a five to zero positive recommendation for what we wrote in for 900 square feet. Um, it doesn't mean you have to build it. I take your point where maybe somebody, you, they're looking at expenses and $1,800 a month and extra uh, you know, utilities, but it's not forced upon anybody to build the 900 square feet. They can build it at 500 square feet. They can make it manageable. We're not saying the island is going to be overrun now with 900 square foot tertiary buildings. It's just an option. So although I don't think it's, it's really a, a big change in your amendment for, it does affect uh, uh, zoning as far as water, sewer, in places that we could use it. So. I appreciate it, but I respectfully disagree, and thank you. Can I respond, or do I respond? Can I respond? I Madam Moderator? Thank you. Lots going on. 
I, I just wanted to see if I could respond. Well, you could respond, but let me just see if there's anyone else. Oh, let me go to sure. Mr. Cohen. Let me go up to Mr. Cohen, and then I can come back to you. Sure. Th thank you, Madam Moderator. Stephen Cohen, I'm an attorney, but I'm not speaking for a client. I'm speaking personally. Uh, I would encourage the town meeting to adopt this article, but not with this amendment. Uh, the tertiary program is perhaps the simplest number one thing that the town meeting has approved in a decade. And it does two things. It has taken literally hundreds of units that were illegal units and brought them into legal unit uh, housing and, and created a bad health situation into a good public safety situation. And it has created an opportunity where every single one of those units is deed restricted for year-round housing. It's the only program that we have that is extremely successful at both of those things. And it should be encouraged. The reason why the planning board is proposing to go from 650 square feet to 900 square feet is that 650 square feet is too small for a family to live in in most cases, and it's slightly smaller than a lot of existing spaces. And what it means is that you can't have a second story and you can't have a finished basement, so you end up with this wasted space. What you do by adding the 250 square feet is allow people to have a basement, allow people to have a second story. It doesn't, you know, 900 square feet is still relatively modest. But the other thing about the tertiary program that a lot of people don't understand is that the number of bedrooms is limited by the number, the um, size of the lot. So if you have a very small lot, you can only have four or five bedrooms. If you have a very large lot, you're capped out at eight bedrooms no matter what. So by allowing for larger, slightly larger homes, we're not increasing the density at all because your number of bedrooms is not increasing even if your uh, area of finished space is increasing. It, we should allow people to have decent living areas, 650 square feet with two bedrooms for a mother or a parent and a child is very, very tight. And most of these homes have basements that end up with illegal apartments or illegal bedrooms because they can't be, or, or they can't be finished. And it would just be great if people could have decent year round safe housing with no density increase that's limited to year round housing in the deed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sutton? You wanted to respond? Um, yes, I did. And at the meeting where the 900 uh, square feet was originally proposed, um, I had stated 750 square feet. I, I stand by my argument. I think that the type of housing that's being um, talked about and bantied about is actually on our tax dollar. We actually voted last night lots of money to these um, trust funds and housing situations. So I do feel like it's not somebody else's tax dollars or somebody else's decision. It's going to be made by others and then people will have to fit themselves into that situation. I just really wanted to provide an opportunity for people to think about this differently. And I, you know, I leave it up to others to vote on that. I'm not, you know, I advocate for what I have said because I think it's correct. Um, but I, I, and I happen to live in an R5, R10 district. So I understand numbers of people. Thank you. On the land. So thank, thank you. you. Mr. Reed? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I am Arthur Reed. I am a lawyer. I'm not speaking on behalf of a client either. Uh, I would point out that the overall ground cover in these districts will limit the amount of the size in any event. And this, in an R1, an R5, where you have a 5,000 square foot lot with maximum ground cover of, I believe, 1,500 square feet, if it's a 5,000 square foot lot, 30% of the size of the lot, uh, it's highly unlikely that anyone is going to go uh, over 650 uh, and uh, uh, certainly not to 900 square feet. Uh, that would basically dwarf the size of the primary dwelling if you're going to have three uh, dwellings on the lot. Where this would come into play on those smaller lots is only on oversized lots, and if you, which do exist in all zoning districts. And if you have an oversized lot, I think it's perfectly appropriate that the uh, ground cover be, uh, if you have the ground cover available, 
that it be allocated in such fashion that you use up to the 900. In any event, uh, this would uh, be subject to uh, exceptions being granted by the planning board under the terms of the article and of the bylaws that now exist in any event. But once again, I don't think you need to worry about it going over uh, 650 square feet on the smallest lots, but again, on the larger lots, I think it's highly appropriate, and therefore I would uh, recommend that the article, uh, that the amendment be voted down and that the article be passed as written. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So on Ms. Um, Sutton's amendment, yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Stephen Welch. I'm speaking for myself this evening. Um, I'd like to provide a little different perspective and a little bit additional information, maybe in reverse order. Um, number one, I think it's important to understand that um, the uh, approval of a tertiary dwelling comes with certain restrictions. Um, those restrictions include ownership and use. They're required to be in the same ownership as one owner, uh, as one other dwelling on the lot, um, or owned by a nonprofit or a religious or educational entity. Um, they're also restricted to year-round use. The other is um, the concept of bedrooms. These are, um, as was stated by uh, Mr. Cohen, Attorney Cohen, when you, uh, if you get a tertiary dwelling approval, you're limited on the number of bedrooms. However, the other side of that is you are not limited to the number of bedrooms. So for instance, in an R10 zone, a typical 10,000 square foot lot would have six to seven bedrooms on it. And where it, which are t tend to be more limp, that is um, to say a three bedroom home, a two bedroom home, and another two bedroom home. Whereas without a tertiary dwelling approval, you're allowed as many bedrooms as the health and building codes and parking will allow you, which is up to 11 to 13. And I think that that's an important distinction. These are two very different results. One tends to be family oriented, family centric, and the other is more akin to Airbnb and overcrowded housing conditions. And I think that those are issues we're trying to address through other measures in the community, but the tertiary dwelling allows us, approval allows us to address it, both with respect to creating housing and making it more family-centric and oriented. The other I'll touch on very briefly because I don't have much time, is the idea of a 650 square foot dwelling and selecting who gets to live in it, a, 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 a single parent with one child or not, not everyone can afford a larger dwelling. If you have a, a 650 square foot, it's bumped up to 900. It's actually livable space um, with a little bit of storage space. And um, I've got a couple other really great points, but my time's out, thanks. Thank you. Okay, on the amendment, yes. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is Ada Ruth Wig. I'd like to move to a vote. Okay, I think we're ready for a vote anyway. So let's just, can we just say that we're gonna vote on the amendment that Ms. Sutton has proposed to this Article 50? The amendment requires a majority vote. A yes vote will adopt that motion. A no vote will defeat the amendment. It's going to be one for yes and two for no and we are ready to vote. Voting is now open. <laughs> Once we've disposed of the Sutton Amendment, we'll go to a vote on Article 50 itself, and I want to correct what I said earlier. It, I will spare you the details, but I was working from an outdated list of housing choice articles, so this will require a two-thirds vote. Voting is now closed. On Ms. Sutton's amendment, yes, 147, no, 343. That amendment is not adopted. Okay, on Article 50, is there anyone 
who wishes to say anything. Seeing no hands or people at the mics, I'm going to go to a vote on Article 50. It does require a two-thirds vote. A yes will adopt the motion as made by the um, planning board as printed in the warrant. A no vote will defeat that motion. We are ready to vote. Voting is now open. It's one for yes, two for no. Voting is now closed. On the main motion on Article 50, yes, 400, no, 108. That is adopted by a two thirds majority. Okay, Article 54. Um, Article 54 is on pages 82 and 83 of the warrant. It received a move to take no action motion from the um, planning board. There was a technical amendment that I read in at the beginning of the meeting yesterday that just related to the comment from the planning board. This has been called by Ms. Lepre and I have the following motion. Moved that tubs and spas be prohibited, sorry, my, oh, I'm back. Moved that tubs and spas be prohibited in the ROH and SOH districts by amending chapter 139 zoning as printed in the warrant under article 54 of the warrant. Is that your motion? Yes? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Motion is made and seconded. Um, Ms. Lepre? Hi, my name is, can you hear me? Hi, my name is Mary Lepre, and I grew up in the old historic district, so I feel I'm quite comfortable and able to speak about it. Just like the other more than 400 old historic district property owners who took the time to fill out a recent survey, I am firmly in favor of Article 54. Hot tubs and spas are out of place in the old historic districts of town and Sconset. A yes on 54 would ban them per permanently and would continue the preservation of these important areas for current and future residents and visitors alike. Hot tubs and spas are attractive nuisances and do not belong in the historic districts. The noises associated with them, machine and human, disturbs the ambiance of these historic neighborhoods. No one is adverse to hearing the laughter of small children, especially not me, I have three at home. What we object to is the partying until the early morning and the lights and sound pollution that accompany hot tubs and spas. There is no place for these in our densely populated historic districts. Another objection to banning hot tubs and spas is what about the people who need them for therapy purposes? A safer option for those needing these treatments would be to have a hot tub or spa installed in a bathroom or other room of their house. This has the added advantage of being available all year. I hope you all will consider that for 200 years, the integrity of the old historic districts in town and Sconset has been carefully guarded and preserved, and what we are looking at right now would drastically alter what we as a community have worked so hard to preserve. So in closing, I urge you to vote, all to vote for Article 54, and let's continue to keep our historic districts historic. Thank you. Yes, Mrs. Dillon? Yes. My name is Lucy Dillon. I and my four fellow Historic Structure Advisory Board members fully support Article 54 to ban hot tubs and spas in Nantucket's historic districts and urge you to vote for Article 54. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Duas? 
Good afternoon. I'm Ann Duez. I'm the sponsor of this article. I live in the old historic district. It's 60 years since I first stepped foot on Nantucket. I'm grateful to my parents for this gift. I stand before you tonight simply as a citizen with an abiding love of Nantucket and a deep anxiety about what is happening to our old historic districts. As a 15-year veteran of the clean team in town, I know this district extremely well. Pools have been banned in the old historic district since 2011, following an overwhelming vote at town meeting. This ban has been successful in helping to maintain the character of our historic districts. Unfortunately, developers and others have exploited loopholes in the zoning code to circumvent the spirit of that vote, the will of the people, and the greater good of preservation by building ever larger spas, hot tubs, and plunge pools. The purpose of this article is to eliminate these loopholes. Property owners in the old historic districts of Nantucket Town and Sconset care as deeply about their neighborhoods today as they did in 2011. In a recent survey, over 70% of them, the people most directly impacted by the question, were in favor of banning hot tubs and spas in the old historic districts. You've heard from Lucy representing the Historic Structures Advisory Board. I also have support from the HDC, from the Nantucket Historical Commission, and from the Nantucket Town Association. You will hear from the first two later. I want to finish with a quote from one of our island real estate agents' websites, which both rings true and illustrates why people from all over the world visit our island. Walk along the quaint side streets past homes from the whaling era, and soak in the beauty of the blooming hydrangeas and roses in pocket gardens. There is no other town in the world like ours. I hope you will vote with the residents of our historic districts and vote with me and to ban these 21st century novelties in our historic districts. Vote yes to vote no for hot tubs and spas in the old historic districts, or we may have to call them formerly historic districts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Oliver? Hi. Um, I'm an HDC member, and this is an ongoing situation that comes up constantly. We took a stand last week and crafted a strong statement, and five of our commissioners encourage you to vote in favor of this article. Thank you. Mr. Lowell? Thank you, Madam Moderator, members of the public. I don't, I, my name is Andy Lowell for New Lane. I don't live in the historic district, but I do live across the street from it. Many pools and water features have been installed in my neighborhood. When a water feature is in use, it becomes very apparent. Voices get louder, but it's not just voices. Music gets louder as well. But my favorite noisemaker is the toy box lid. You know, I like to take a rest on weekends after a long, long week at work. And I'll put on a boring game of golf and fall right to sleep. But when the toy box lid gets slammed half a dozen times, it sounds like uh, you know a, a shotgun going off, and napping doesn't become an option anymore. Is having a water feature a property right? Do I have property rights for peaceful enjoyment? Mechanical noise, heaters, circulators installed inches from the property line. I hear them running night and day. Most equipment becomes louder with age as well. Leaf blowers are deployed sometimes several times a week if necessary to keep the mulch off of the adjoining patio and out of the pool. The biggest concern for everyone should be where the pools and water features get drained for repairs or if the water turns green. I witnessed at a neighboring house at 7 New Lane drain their feature three times in one season into the street with a high volume pump. The neighbor's shell driveway was washed out. The curbless shoulders of New Lane were eroded. The street was impassable by a bicycle. The water traveled to Mill Pond into the wetlands. I contacted several departments. No one seemed privy on enforcement. I spoke with a leak repair contractor who was on island. He works statewide. Nantucket is the only town in Massachusetts with no regulations for discharge. 
Other towns have to hire a septic or slowly discharge onto your own yard. This is not an isolated case. I've, if you I've, could wrap up, please. I will, thank you. I've witnessed this at other areas, pumping into the street, pumping into ponds. None of this is an argument. There are legitimate concerns on a wide variety of impacts that are not being addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, up. go ahead. Leslie Forbes, I live in Madiket. I do not live in the ROH or SOH. I think you're going to have to get closer, Mrs. Closer Ms. for Forbes. me, too. Yep. How's that? That's good. Okay, my name is Leslie Forbes. I consider the ROH and the SOH districts the core of Nantucket's historic past. I go into town daily to enjoy its charm and the feel and the, uh, of the same ambience that my Chase ancestors felt. Currently, pools are not allowed in the ROH and SOH, but hot tubs and spas are. Luckily, there have only been a f modest number at this point in the two districts. As most property owners respect the tradition and the historic nature of the area, and if, but looking forward, we need to plan ahead. As the properties change hands, there are incredible financial incentives to jazz up your property with some sort of water feature. Through a quirk in the rules, in the bylaw, there's no limit on the gallon size of pools, of hot tubs and spas, and so they've become deeper. Um, so I want to get ahead of this. I'm concerned that as we look forward, the financial incentives to install water features will become just, you won't be able to avoid it. You won't be able to say no. So I would like us to vote yes on number four, 54, ban hot tubs and, pool, and spas, just like we banned pools in the ROH and SOH districts. Thank you. Thank you. No, I think we're ready to vote, so we'll just go to a vote. Okay. Sarah. Sarah. All right. So someone has moved the question. Multiple people have moved the question. So we'll go to a vote on that. And if people say no, we'll go back to debate, and I'll recognize you, and you can, you can speak. I need people at the at the microphone at the microphones. Did you have a point of order, Ms. Duas? I did. Um, we spoke earlier about showing a map of oh, the right, ROH the map. and the SOH to make certain that right. people are very very clear what districts we're talking about because some people don't really get okay. what the okay. boundaries of these districts okay. are. Okay, that's Thank good. You. Got it. Map. There you go. That's the R. Um, this, this, yeah, I, I understand the zones. It's the residential old historic zone. It's right here, shown in pink. And there you have it again. And that's it sort of bigger. And that is looking very much like Sconset to me. So that's in pink, the Sconset Old Historic District. A small but powerful district. <laughs> and then, I can, I can say that because I live there. And then, let's go back to town. Because that's a little more interesting, I think. Okay. And there's town. Okay. Okay. Um, Ms. Ms. Tuas, we, you never asked for your um, your visual when you were speaking. Did you want us to show that now? Uh, yes, please. Okay. 
Okay. So that is um, Ms. Duez's um, slide. All right. So we have a motion to move the question. Point of order. Point sure. of order. Point of order. Yes, that would be delightful. <laughs> All right, you can take that down now. Thank you, Madam, Madam Moderator. My name is Harvey Young. Um, I know people want to move the question, and I know my son moved the question last night, and that's an important part of debate. And I do defer to you, but we so often hear both sides of the story, and, and I think we only heard one side tonight. I, I already know how I'm going to vote on this, but I think there are at least one person that wants to speak for the other side, so I don't know if we can hear, hear that person. Not, Thank you. Not technically a point of order, but okay. Madam Moderator. <laughs> Madam Moderator. Uh, point of order. Yeah. I think because of uh, new information was presented with the maps, people might have some questions about that. So by opening up with the new information, I think um, we should have somebody that's standing there oh, be able to comment. Okay. So how about this? How about if I let Mr. Dutra say whatever he wishes to say, and then we take a vote on the motion to move the question, unless, and then you can decide if you want to hear more or less. How about that? Go ahead, Mr. Dutra. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, could you put the zoning map back up? I think it's- uh, Town? Uh, the town, that would be yeah. great. Um, and I think this is one important point, and I'm gonna try to be fast, because I know I don't have much time here. Um, and I know I got a lot of uh, arrows pointed at me right now, but anyways, um, there's a plenty of lots in this district where it would not affect anybody at all. Um, I understand there is a big problem here, you, and, but it's really hard to zone greed, and, that, and it is happening. But there are other people that are not full of greed, and they want to enjoy their backyards, that are, and they, have the, they should deserve the right to do that. I am, and I should have said this up front, a, a landscape and swimming pool contractor, and um, I don't really like to do jobs in town because of the controversy and the, the, how difficult access is and stuff like that. And so it's not really affecting me necessarily economically, but I feel like there's a loss of right here that should be pointed out. Um, we deserve to be able to do what, our, what we want in our backyard. The noise factor, there are plenty of noises. I, I myself have listened to loud music playing at middle of the night basketball courts, things. And lastly, the most important thing, I think anyways, which was brought up, is the environmental impacts and the safety impacts and so many different things that we are not bringing up. We're just bringing up the points of uh, some disgruntled homeowners. And I feel like that we, that's the reason why the planning board and the board of selectmen, I believe, if, correct me if I'm wrong, voted for this. Uh, uh, against this article, and I feel that we should do something right that's good for everybody in the community and, and, and create a better article that affects people um, in a better way, and I feel like that we need to uh, think about this seriously and give some time to uh, allow um, an article to be written correctly that affects all the different aspects of what's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we had a motion to move the question. I, see you, I, I right. see you, Mr. Wall. Make a little comment here for a second. Go, go ahead. How are we doing here? Is this working? Yes. But you know what? If you're going to talk, turn around and face the, the audience because the people... way. It's all... We've I know. Everything. You're supposed to talk to me, but oh, okay. when you talk to talk me, to people you. don't hear I you. I like talking to you, actually. A lot. So I brought something with me tonight. You got to talk into the I microphone. Brought something though. with me tonight. It's a little little love socket. <laughs> that is a little smaller than the average size of these little water features. Now, I thought I'd spread a little love around. We all 
Well, so argumentative last night and it started right off where I thought it would. So welcome to Ban Tucket. This, and I want to talk about what Jesse said. He's actually nailed it, a few things. This is more about outdoor living than it is about a pool or a spa or a place to dip your feet. We used to play wiffle ball a lot. I don't even know if they sell them anymore. Horseshoes, croquet, now it's fire pits, cooking cabanas, Bluetooth speakers everywhere. Outside hockey, basketball, it's gotten a little fancier. They have those gorilla hoops, you know, you crank the handle and it goes up and down. Very easy, none of this junk anymore. You can really do a lot of things in your yard. Cornhole, I never really understood that name, but that's everywhere as well. So, you've, you've, I don't know what to say. You've, you've I am never going to live in the ROH like my brother, but be careful what you wish for. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think we're ready to vote on this article. So, let's just do that. Another point of order? Yes? There was no amendment. I'm just dropping the motion to call the question and going to a vote, because I think you're all ready to vote, Sorry, right? Madam moderator, if that's the case, I actually do have something that I'd like to say very briefly. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so then we're going to do the motion to call the question then. Okay, so. No, not now. We were going to, but now we're going to vote on the motion to move the question. Okay, well, I'd like to say so something. So the motion to move the question will end debate. It does require a two-thirds vote. A yes vote will adopt the motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. If the motion to move the question is adopted, we will go immediately to a vote on Article 54. If the motion to move the question is defeated, we will continue with debate on Article 54. So we are ready to vote on the motion to move the question. Voting is now open. Yes is one, no is two. It does require a two-thirds vote. Did I say voting is now open? I hope, because the gym people will be very angry with me. <sighs> okay, voting is now closed. On the motion to move the question, yes, 465, no, 93, that motion is adopted by a two-thirds vote. So now we're going to go right to a vote on the motion on Article 54. The motion that you're voting on is what is shown on the screen. A yes vote will adopt the motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. It requires a two-thirds vote and we are ready to vote. Voting is now open. At least we're not counting hands. There is that. Okay, voting is now closed. Whoops, math.
Oh, okay. Great. So on the motion, yes, 376, no, 186, two-thirds is 375. That motion is adopted. Okay, please don't do that. That's really exceptionally impolite and rude to your fellow citizens, as I have said multiple times. I understand if you want to cheer, if you go into the gym, it's <laughs> unbelievable in there. They're just, it's like a party, and they, they cheer and do everything. So this is, this is kind of the bummer room, but what can I tell you? Okay. So Article 55. Article 55 is on page um, 83 and 84. It received a move to take no action. It was called by Ms. Ionetta. Is she here? Oh, there you are. OK. Now, do, do you have a? Do you have a positive uh, a motion that you want? You want? Did you, do you have a positive motion you want to make on this? No, I, I simply want to oppose it. Oh, you just want to oppose it? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, th you. then you don't need to call it. Okay. So let's let's withdraw your call because if we if we. Withdraw your call, it will just be moved to take no action. You won't have to oppose it. Um, it just fails on its own initiative. Unless there is someone else who wants to step into, and I do not see anyone. So I think the motion that I would recognize Mr. Trudell to make would be moved to take no action. That is my motion, Madam Chair. Is there a second? That is my motion. Second. Okay, that motion has been made and seconded. So on that motion, a yes vote will take no action. A no vote will defeat the motion to take no action. We'll have to come up with some other motion to make. But I don't think anyone wants to go forward with this, so let's hope everyone understands. Does anyone have any questions? We hardly ever vote on motions like this. Motion to take no action. Okay. I, I'll try. Okay. So the, the planning board's motion was to take no action. The person who called the article is opposed to the article. The article fails by virtue of the take no action motion. So there's no reason to call and talk about it because the person who called it is opposed to it. The only reason to call it is if you wanted it to pass. And if you wanted it to pass, you would have to come up with a positive motion. Okay. But I don't think there's anybody who wants that to happen. I think, I think we were set with 54 and this 55 doesn't need to happen. So unless anyone disagrees with me and they want to discuss 55, we should take a vote on the motion to take no action, which effectively disposes of Article 55. So a a any questions at all? Because I know it's unusual. Okay. I still have questions. I'm sorry, I don't understand what would happen next. Okay, who, who's asking me that? Oh, that's you. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, okay. So you're opposed to Article 55, correct? Yes. You do not want Article 55 to pass? Correct. Correct? Correct. The motion to take no action, which is the planning board's motion, defeats Article 55. It okay. takes no action and it just moves it off our agenda. Okay. And so there will be no vote. So we're there basically taking no we're we're taking no action. We're just and, and in doing that 
the recommendation of the planning board stands? Yes, we'd be voting on the recommendation of the planning board. Okay. Otherwise, we'd have to make a positive motion and then we'd have to and then we'd be discussing the merits of article 55. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right. So on the motion to take no action, which I do so infrequently, is that a majority vote, Mr. Giorgio? It is, right? Okay. The motion to take no action is a majority vote. So a yes vote will adopt the motion to take no action. A no vote will defeat the motion to take no action. We are ready to vote. Voting is open. Yes is one, no is two. Okay, voting is now closed. On that motion to take no action, yes, 520, no, 24. That motion is adopted. Okay. Article 57. Article 57 is on page 85 of the warrant. You're withdrawing your call? Okay, thank you. Mr. Mead, right? Okay, Mian, okay. So Mr. Meehan is withdrawing his call on Article 57, which has also a move to take no action recommendation. Is there anyone who wants to make a positive motion and bring Article 57 forward? Seeing no one, then we're gonna just do exactly what we just did on 55. We're going to take a vote on the motion to take no action. A yes vote will adopt that, and a no vote will defeat it. I'm going to recognize Mr. Trudell, Chairman of the Planning Board, for the purpose of making that motion. So moved, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Is there a second? second. Motion is made and seconded. I don't think we need any discussion. I think we can go right to a vote. Voting is now open. It's one for yes, two for no. It requires a majority vote. Okay, voting is now closed. On that motion, yes, 525, no, 14. That motion is adopted. Okay, Article 58. Article 58 starts on page 85, continues to page 86 and 87. 
It did receive a positive motion from the planning board as printed in the warrant. I'll ask for your unanimous consent to waive the reading of that amendment, I mean of that motion, and recognize Mr. Trudell, chair of the planning board, for the purpose of making the motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion is made and seconded. Um, I believe I'm going to have an amendment or something on this. But before I go to that, is there anyone who wishes to address the subject matter of the article itself? Uh, Ms. Williams, okay. The, as moderator declared, the planning board gave it a favorable recommendation. This is another mechanism to create housing. It only affects commercial properties, not residential properties. The planning board still has special permit authority by a four to five vote. It only adds one unit. You could be 100 square feet too short on a land size and not get the unit. Um, they have to still meet parking, ground cover, setbacks, and everything else, but it gives the planning board the mechanism to approve a fourth unit. You can only have a maximum of four units on a commercial piece of property. Almost all of these units are over the top of commercial enterprises. It's 2.74% of the island's qualified commercial zones. Um, so not in the big bucks luxury areas. These areas are uh, commercial industrial, commercial neighborhood, commercial mid-island, commercial downtown, commercial tech. Uh, not in any of the ROHs or R1s or R2 or 10s or R5s or LUGs. People do not always fit into the affordable quotient, and I believe that's the uh, motion that's going to try to be made. I ask you to uh, vote against making one of these units affordable. They're already affordable because of where they're located and the fact that they're over commercial enterprises. Right now, if you are short and you want that fourth unit, uh, you have to get a variance, and it's a use variance which the zoning board cannot legally grant since 1979 when that ability was taken away from them. Um, not everybody fits into the affordable, as I said. A lot of people are 151% of median. They don't fit into it. More regulations are counterproductive to creating housing. That is the objective. We need all kinds of housing, not just affordable housing. We need moderate housing. We need all kinds for people that just don't qualify, but they are at that 151% or 152%, you're screwed. Um, again, again, the planning board has absolute complete control over conditions, um, parking, and everything else. Why are we punishing people who are trying to add one more unit? This also would enable all of this special permit granting authority to rest with the planning board as opposed to ping-ponging back and forth between the ZBA and the planning board. Over the years, we've done that several times. We've taken things that were going between the two boards and caught in that never-never land and given it to the planning board so all the special permit granting authority rests with them. It streamlines the process and allows more housing. It is a simple majority because the state has decided that when you create more housing units, it can go on a simple majority. If you have an oversized lot, this is very easy to provide the four units, but you may have, as I said, even one square foot less than what's required for another unit. So it's still a maximum of four no matter what you do. Would you please vote down another regulation on these units that are not really the luxury units. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Molden, you, you called this. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Emily Molden for the Nantucket Land Council. I don't have an amendment to make on this particular article, but I did call it because we are opposed to it. The definition of apartments in Nantucket zoning bylaw currently sets pretty clear, very clear standards for how many apartment units are allowed to be established on a property in each of the commercial districts based on the size of the lot. Article 58 adds language enabling the creation of an additional apartment unit through the granting of a special permit, as you heard. This is intended to give those properties that don't meet the current standard the ability to get one more unit. 
there will always be properties that don't quite meet the criteria or the standards that have been established and voted on in our zoning bylaw. But creating a special permit process to make exceptions for those properties is not an appropriate way to approach zoning. While the current criteria for apartment units are clearly defined, this sets up a subjective special permit process without definition around who will and who will not qualify. The proposal will ultimately increase density, and as you heard, it includes no restrictions on how these bonus units are to be rented or used. So we ask you to please vote no on Article 58. This is not about creating an additional restriction or regulation. It's about stopping the increase of additional density without any clear standards. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Seeing no one, I think we are ready for a vote. Oh, Mr. Trudell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't want to delay the vote. However, I would like to make a comment. Uh, a lot of this is for commercial uh, uh, zoning. And when you look at commercial zoning, uh, we're having a lot of difficulty with housing for our workforce. So in this particular area, most of the time, majority of the time, the, the dwelling units are really going to be for the employees. And it's going to help uh, the, the labor force that we have. So I would. Um, can, I would strongly ask you to um, vote in the, in the positive for this. Thank you. Ms. Goss? I'm Vicki Goss. Um, I hate having to speak, but um, I agree with the housing, um, with, with Emily Molden, um, and I'm against adding more density in already dense areas. They're talking about adding more housing to um, places around the stop and shop, around places that are already jam-packed with cars, with, with um, movement, with people. And I really get seriously annoyed when people say, oh, well, these are just for working people, or these are these aren't luxury areas. And I'm thinking, well, why don't we deserve a tree or a yard or um, a, a garden or a park? You know, we don't have to be all crammed together because we're just workforce. Um, so I, I'm against adding more density in areas that are already dense. And I urge you to vote no on this particular article. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lowell. Hello. Back at it. We haven't even finished this town meeting. We've gone two different directions on housing. All right. So this article is confusing and something I didn't even understand until this came up at a meeting last year. This is really about, like, let's say you have an apartment that could be, but it's slightly under the amount that's allowed in that zoning district. It, it, it gives us the ability to waive that. You know, it could be 20 square feet. This is not creating new, like a new room, a new apartment. This is creating something out of something that's already there that's just not quite big enough. Similar to what we did, and I didn't get to say this earlier on the tertiary discussion, with about 80 tertiary dwellings in Nantucket now. Most of them were approved existing dwellings that were given a waiver on the existing size, okay? So we've kind of come a long way in this whole sort of area of how big something is inside for one or two people to live in. So this really isn't anything that's adding anything. It's just adding, it's making a legal apartment that's not quite legal just by a little bit. And so that room was just becomes wasted. So you're either for it or against. I thought we were in favor of housing this year, but we'll, we'll see. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Bruce Miller. Uh, I just have a question. Um, isn't this the type of issue that normally comes before the Zoning Board of Appeals? when there's a little slight variation that we, where we want to grant relief? 
Not with apartments, they go to the planning board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Iverson? I, I am willing to bet there's at least 50 business owners in this room that would do anything for one more bed, okay? These are in commercial areas. They are not gonna be STRs. I agree, development's an issue, but so is employment. I mean, how many businesses on this island are shorthanded? Don't have enough staff. I think we should, we should consider where we create density and what we're creating it for. And I would argue housing in, in, in commercial districts for employees is needed right now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, up in the back. Hi, my name is Ken Panasak. Um, I'm a business owner and I'd like to provide housing for my employees by allowing us to build these units. We take away the need for other housing and a lot of people in the trades make more than the money that uh, would allow them to qualify for low income housing. So this is an option for those people to have a place to live in and thrive on Nantucket. An opportunity that most people in here have had and it's time to give every, everybody the chance to thrive. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Ms. Moulton. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Emily Molden, just a, a couple of follow-up comments. I think with regard to the discussion about allowing an extra apartment when you're just a few square feet shy, the way that this is set up, it will also allow an additional apartment if you're 999 square feet shy. There's no distinction. Uh, and I think that if we want to have a discussion about the standards for how many apartments should be allowed, then that's another conversation to have. But again, this is set up to be very subjective. And I also just want to point out that if the intention of this is to create more workforce housing or the type of housing that the community is looking for, it could. Because I had listened to what Emily had said about how it hadn't been defined as to who would get these. Though the defenders of it are all talking about workforce housing, et cetera, which is all fine. I'm just, is there something in this that says, that backs up what they're, they're saying, that this is for workforce housing or employee housing? Like, is this actually tied to that, or is that just conceptually what we think it's going to do? Mr. Trudell? Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, this is also under a special permit, which allows us to make restrictions as the application comes in. So we could, uh, depending on the size of it, if it was a certain percentage or it was 10 feet shy or something like that, we could waive this and pass this. Uh, we can also put restrictions on something that we approve to make it affordable for, the, for their workforce or employee housing. So under the special permit, it gives us um, some ability and restrictions to work with on each individual application. Right, I understand that. Thank you for that explanation. I'm just wondering, so then this would become defined when the special permit is requested or applied for? Is that when the um, occupant or, you know, who it's going to would be defined? Ms. Snell? I'm, I'm just wondering. Hi, I'm Leslie Snell, the Deputy Director of Planning. Um, the current bylaw does not say, you know, who may or may not occupy the units, their market rate, they're open for anyone. But in this case, if this article was approved, uh, a special permit would be in place, the planning board would hold a public hearing, they would listen to the specifics of the application, and they could place conditions on the additional units as far as occupancy and you know, anything else that they thought was appropriate. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Okay, so on Article 58, the motion is as printed in the warrant. Um, this does require a simple majority under the Housing Choice Act, not a two-thirds vote. Um, a yes vote will adopt the planning board's motion as printed in the warrant. A no vote will defeat that motion, and we are ready to vote. Voting is now open. One for yes, two for no.
Voting is now closed on the main motion on Article 58, yes, 325, no, 222. That is a majority vote, and that is adopted. Okay. That, I believe, is the end of zoning. Woohoo! Um, and that brings us to Article 69. Article 69 is on page 115 of the warrant, continues all the way to page 117, the Finance Committee's motion was moved not to adopt the article. I have a positive motion, which I am going to ask for your indulgence not to read because it's very long. It's essentially what's printed in the warrant with the language move that chapter 125A of the Code of Nantucket be amended as follows. And then can you scroll down to where the highlighting is? So we have a new um, subsection C that we're adding. It shall be unlawful to sell, distribute, or commercially use the following single-use petroleum-based plastic products in the town and county of Nantucket on or after January 1, 2023. Uh, to Pam Murphy, sure. Yes. So let me just say, you're going to just say motion. Yes, and move. so moved. So moved. Madam and is there a second? Second. Motion is made and seconded. Now, Mr. Mandel, who was the sponsor of this article, has a, had a health Sorry. issue and wasn't able to come be at this meeting. So he's asked Ms. Murphy, I think, to read a statement. So, Ms. Murphy. Exactly. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Moderator. My name is Pam Murphy. Um, Article 69 seeks to add the smallest of the single-use alcohol containers to our existing Chapter 125A of the Code of the Town. The article focuses on the smallest containers of only 100 milliliters or less, about a few tablespoons. This article is important to reduce litter and the associated toxic elements flowing into our groundwater, aquifer, our beaches, and Nantucket's environment. Several towns off-island have now banned these small single-use alcohol containers with no adverse effect on package stores. The state attorney general has approved the bans. Other Massachusetts towns are also considering this type of small container ban. Similar bans are in effect in other parts of the country. A few points to consider. These are one of the most littered items on our island and in the world. The clean team and others who pick up litter across our island collect thousands of these toxic items each year. NIPS are a challenging waste product. During the litter derby last year, they sorted and collected litter and isolated 200 pounds of NIP containers. The clean team supports this article. This is not about drinking alcohol. It's about protecting Nantucket's finite resources, its natural environment, groundwater, and aquifer from a nuisance and toxic type of litter. The article is not a prohibition, nor does it ban the sale of alcoholic products. These small single-use alcoholic containers are tailored for one purpose, and that is on-the-go consumption, which promotes litter. Toss the container out the vehicle window to avoid an open container violation. In addition to being a major litter source with low cash outlay, these smallest of containers pose health threats, especially for our underage drivers. These small containers are not recyclable. They are rarely deposited in the plastic bins at our landfill. 
These are the smallest size of any single-use plastic alcohol containers. There are other size containers available as alternatives that are less likely to be littered and are easier to pick up. The State Attorney, Attorney General has already approved the ban of these items. Enforcement will be passive as set forth in the existing bylaw. There are site-specific areas where this litter is more prevalent than other areas. For example, the area between the high school property and Nantucket Auto Body property, the Lover's Lane area, the State Forest, and the Disc Golf area, along our bike paths, our beaches, and the parking areas. Vendors have no part in picking up the littered items. That pickup is left to the clean team, the DPW, and other conscientious citizens. Deposit programs to address this litter problem fail annually at the state legislature. Nantucket is left to be on its own to deal with this litter problem. Other towns have already successfully banned these single-use alcohol containers. Examples from Massachusetts include Chelsea and Falmouth. Mashpee, Bourne, Framingham, and Winthrop are moving forward too. Other towns are also considering similar bans. No package store in these towns has gone out of business because of the small container ban. All the package stores in these towns have reapplied for their annual licenses. Fair share revenue has not been affected. Chelsea has a similar ban in place since 2018. The Chelsea Council President, Roy Avalaneda, initiated the ban concept due to litter and public intoxication concerns. The Commonwealth Magazine reported in August of 2019 that in Chelsea, lip, nip litter was largely disappeared. Alcohol-related ambulance responses have been reduced from 742 in 2017 before the ban to less than 200. Public drunkenness has diminished from 222 incidents pre-ban in 2017 to only 86 in the first half of 2019. Falmouth enacted the ban effective October 2021. Peter Hargrave, the proponent, reports he surveyed all 19 licensed establishments. All are complying. In a recent litter pickup, their version of our clean team noticed a significant reduction in nip litter. All 19 establishments have reapplied for 2022 licenses. None are going out of business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. DaCosta? I, I just want to, I support this article. I just have a question. I understand the NIP part of it. The second section, I'd like someone to give me a definition of what that is, because I don't quite understand what, what those are. Okay. Thank you. Can you put up the second? Yes. So you're looking for a definition, Mr. DaCosta, of what commercially or industrially compostable products are not exempted except for commercially compostable plastics that cannot be composted on Nantucket. Yeah, I, I know what a nip bottle is and I'm fine with getting rid of them. I, believe me, I pick up hundreds behind my boat all summer, but I don't know what this is and I'd, I'd like a clarification before we vote on it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Giorgio, can we impose upon you? He's asking what is meant by commercially or industrially compostable products that are, ex what's exempt and what isn't. He's looking for a definition of that. So, Madam Moderator, yeah. um, I believe we should focus on um, compostable material plastics that cannot be composted on Nantucket. So anything that was, uh, is not allowed to go through the composter at the solid waste facility would be accepted. So any plastics that can't be composted on Nantucket, on Nantucket are banned? Yes. In addition to NIPS? Yes. Okay. That's the second part of this. Yes. Well, I, I'm very concerned about what that says and what that is because I don't know what products that is. Um, I, I want to know what products that is. If I get a, a container of, of paint thinner that's plastic and you're telling me, I, I want to know what that is before I vote or I'm going to make an amendment to strike that section because that's just way too vague. Okay. Somebody needs to tell me what those containers are. I understand what a nip is. Everyone in this room understands what a nip is, but no one understands what a commercial or industrial 
compositable products are not exempted. You know, that's just way, way above my pay grade. Do you have an answer for us? No, I have a, I have a, a question. You have a question. Yeah, okay. I don't know that anyone has an answer to your question, Mr. DaCosta, because this is not, this article was not recommended. So I'm going to make a motion that we strike that line. Okay, so you're asking that we strike the commercially or industrially compostable products are not exempted except for commercially compostable plastics that cannot be composted on Nantucket. Correct. Okay, that motion is made and seconded. On Mr. DaCosta's amendment, Yes, are you on the amendment? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Because I think, Ms. Duez, you're on the, more on the main motion, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, I think, by illustration, I would like to ask town council, uh, and would the case of a vanilla extract plastic bottle qualify in this case? Just as an illustration. I mean, that is a commercially industrial compostable product not exempted, or is it? And that's, that's the size of a nip. It's a plastic bottle, and what the hell. Madam Moderator, through you to the previous speaker, is that something that can be composted on Nantucket? That's the standard. And if the answer is no, then it, it, would, not, it would not be allowed. OK. So I don't know, is there anyone here who knows what plastic can and cannot be composted? Do you, Ms. Zoda? Just having been to the dump, and because I recycle, they'll take everything except a plastic flower pot because of the soil. I think we're missing the bigger point of, we have a huge problem here on Nantucket with plastics. And if we don't ban the nips, we're gonna find them all over the place. Right. So, so I, he, I, don't, I haven't seen anybody tell someone at the dump, you can't put that plastic in because it's not proper. You just bring your plastic and you put it in. Okay. So Mr. DaCosta's motion leaves in the nips and takes out the other plastics. Uh, Ms. Sutton? Yeah, yeah, Madam Moderator, excuse me. I just, uh, just a couple of points. I believe the um, examples that have been given in those types of plastics that were given, the vanilla plastic container and the paint thinner are recyclable. So would go into recycling, probably should be up here in that somewhere. As far as commercially compostable plastics, um, compostable plastics are not compostable on Nantucket because you need to have a higher degree of composting than we currently do. I think we do 160 to 165 degrees, and I think you need a hotter, hotter compost to compost the compostable plastics, if you see what I mean. So I um, any of the compostable plastics that come to the island are not compostable on the island. And I generally just put them in recyclable. <laughs> that's, okay. that's what I do, but that's what I know about. Um, okay, so Mr. DaCosta's motion, I'm um, motion to amend. Yes. If you could come down to a microphone. Just on this motion, I think we're talking about two separate things. Could uh, we have your name? Please. Oh, I'm sorry. Herschel Allerhand, uh, Union Street. Thank you. Uh, oh, if we're just talking about nips, why don't we just say that anything that's in that size is, uh, is, is banned we, and, and, and leave the rest yeah. of it alone? Because you're talking about plastics now, you're talking about a separate, a completely separate issue which, with, with, different, with different products. Uh, the question about the nips, I was told, is that it doesn't make a difference whether it's combustible or not. People don't bring it to the, uh, the, they don't bring it anyway. So why don't we just say that we're dealing with the nips and those are outlawed? And the, the larger question about plastic, maybe we should leave open until we get better definitions. Thank you. So Mr. DaCosta's motion would leave in the ban of nips under 125A2C but would eliminate the 
exemption of commercially or industrial compostable products that are not, um, cannot be composted. On the motion to amend, Mr. Reed. Thank you. Yes, uh, specifically on this, I think the language that was added, which is now proposed to be stricken, doesn't make any sense. And I think I can make a suggestion that would accomplish what I, I very much agree with the point that uh, Mr. DaCosta is making. But I think that what we should do is to amend this so that it would basically provide that compostable uh, plastics, which are compostable on Nantucket, are exempted from the bylaw. I, the way it reads, the way the language that would be stricken reads, uh, th would be that commercial or industrially compostable products are not exempted. In other words, they would be prohibited, except for those that cannot be composted on Nantucket. And I think that the idea would be more that it would be those that can be composted on Nantucket uh, would be exempted, but no others. Didn't we just learn that no commercial plastics can be composted on Nantucket? Well, we, maybe we did, and maybe we, we didn't. I'm not sure. It was suggested. <laughs> it was suggested. I don't know one way or the other. I don't have a clue, and I don't think anybody else here does as to uh, what the substance of all of this is. But I think that the point is that... Uh, well, then that shouldn't we just delete it so we don't do something silly? Yeah, I'd, I'd, if that's the case, if, if nothing is compostable on Nantucket, I would suggest, and perhaps I would uh, amend uh, Bobby's motion to say that, to, to strike Section C. I don't, uh, Sarah? I think that would be beyond the scope. But I, anyway, I, I, let's I, go back to Mr. DaCosta's motion. I, yes. The, the, I think your line, motion makes sense, Mr. DaCosta. Well, so. I'm trying. Um, so the original line there that says compostable plastics are exempt from this bylaw was in the bylaw before this amendment. Correct. I don't want to take that out. Right. We can't. All I want, I, I just, I, I mean, I hate plastics as much as anyone in this room. I pick so much of it up out of the water over the course of the summer, I could probably sink a barge. But that being said, this is just, this is a rabbit hole I don't want to go down because all of a sudden I go to Marine Lumber or the hardware store or wherever to buy something that I've been buying for 30 years and I can't get buy anymore because it's not, an, it's not the right type of plastic containers. You know, I, I, I had to learn how to drink a different coffee after 30 years because I couldn't get a K-cup anymore. So I've, I've come around. It, it took a while, but I've come around. But I don't want to have this problem again. So this is just... There's no one in this room that can tell me exactly what this does and doesn't do. I'm all in favor of getting rid of nips. Let's get rid of them, period. Let's just leave the nip part in. Let's take this part out and let's move on. Okay. Please. Mr. Gullickson, on Mr. DaCosta's amendment? Um, primarily, yes. I just want to point out that the, the exception is the exception to things that are in the bylaw. And the things that are in the bylaw are, are listed in the beginning part, straws, bottle yolks, drinking cups, lids, etc. So the exceptions are exceptions to that list. So a bottle of vanilla is not on that list. So we don't care what it's made out of because it's not included to begin with. So it doesn't have to be accepted. It's not included. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. On Mr. DaCosta's, are you speaking on the amendment? I am not, no. Okay. All right, so on Ms. are you on the amendment? Yes. Okay, go ahead, and please identify yourself for the record. <laughs> um, my name is Dionis Carter, and I just wanted to ask a question that might help with clarity in this, which was just sort of touched on. Um, it's the idea of it being single-use plastics, and these things being defined as single-use plastics, and the only thing that Section C speaks on is those single-use plastics. So it shouldn't affect things like almond extract, or any small, any small bottles, just for being small. It is about whether or not its intention is to be used once and immediately thrown away. Um, so if it does not get used once and then immediately thrown away, my assumption is it would not be affected by this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. So Mr. DaCosta's amendment requires a majority vote. A yes vote will adopt his amendment. A no vote will defeat his amendment. I think we're ready to vote. Requires a majority vote. Voting is now open. One is yes, two is no. Voting is now closed. That's yes, 490, no, 67. That is adopted. So then on the, on the main motion so, on Article 69, I have a couple of hands. I know you've been up there for a while. Um, Ms. Duez, why don't you go ahead? Um, Denise, did you have something you wanted to say? I did. If, oh, uh, Ms. Ms. Kernow, sure. Yeah, sure. So the reason that the Finance Committee had motion not to adopt, if you go up to, I've got to put on my glasses, 125A-2, go down to letter E, define products in plastic, non-compostable, or non-recyclable containers of one liter, so 34 ounces or less, and that includes box water, carbonated water, drinking water, flavored water. So that is a pretty big container that would then be banned. So that was why it, we had lots of discussions about um, banning the alcohol, the nips. And in general, there was a favorable Wait, attitude. I, I'm confused, though, because it says containers for alcoholic beverages in less than or equal to 100 milliliters. No, Sarah, if you go to one. 125A-2, and go to, go to 5. Oh, it's 5. Oh. Sorry. It's E. It's in the, in the warrant. It's E. 20, the, um, are you saying A5, drinking water in plastic or non-recyclable containers of one liter or less? Yep. That's not that already exists. That already exists in the warrant, in the, in the, no. In the bylaw. But the motion changes it to define plastic. Yeah. Define in the warrant, it says define products in plastic. So it expands it past. Right. Oh, right. So in what was printed in the warrant, in the original article, mm -hmm. it was different. And Mr. Mandel changed it for his motion. He refined it for his motion. Okay. Okay. So what you saw in the, in the warrant under 125A2 on page 116 said defined products in plastic, non-compostable, or non-recyclable containers of one liter, 34 ounces or less, he, he changed that. I think probably to address your, the Finance Committee's concerns. So in what he's proposed as his amendment, or his motion. Uh, can you go back up to the list? He has one through six, and he's eliminated. Let's see. He has eliminated, he's eliminated defined products in plastic, non compostable, and he's left in drinking water in plastic or non-recyclable containers of one liter, 34 ounces or less. And I believe that's what's in the current um, bylaw. And then he's left in single-use non-recyclable beverage pods. So I think he may have addressed your concern. 
okay. as part of his motion. I just want to make sure we're not banning nearly every drinkable item that's 34 ounces or less on the island. No. Okay. Okay. Ms. Duez. Thank you, Anne Duez. Speaking to you now as a 15-year veteran of the CLEAN team. Um, the CLEAN team was cited many times in Pam's um, uh, delivery of Bruce's, mes uh, Bruce's message. And I can tell you from firsthand experience over 15 years that nips are probably one of the most frequent uh, plastic items that I pick up. And so I am certainly very much in favor of this article. I wanted to talk about um, the, 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 the reason I think it's fine is because a lot of nip, uh, nip quantities are available in glass. So uh, for those people who need to have nips for whatever reason, um, I would like to think not underage drinkers, but who knows, um, glass is available. There's only one brand that I'm aware of that might not be in glass. It's probably the most popular one. It's called Fireball. Um, so those of you who love Fireball, I would suggest you write to the manufacturer and say, we need glass. Now, I have one, I want to take one small exception to what Pam said about recycling. I, I did actually recycle some of these bottles. I saved them for about three years, and about three or four years ago, I made a wreath for the wreath festival out of nip bottles. It was a beautiful wreath. I had all different reds and greens and, and a big long banner that said, water, water, everywhere, and many a nip we drink. Well, that was bought for $125, and it was donated to Hatches. So um, uh, from my heart, I can say, please vote to ban NIPS. And those of you who need Fireball, just write the manufacturer. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Patterson? Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. I would respectfully move the question. OK. Um, Mr. Patterson has moved the question. Um, as you know from hard-fought experience, that requires a two-thirds vote, and we'll end debate, and then we'll go right to a vote on the main motion. A yes vote will adopt the motion to move the question. A no vote will defeat it. I think we're ready to vote. Voting is now open. One for yes, two for no. On the motion to move the question, it does require a two-thirds vote. Okay, voting is now closed. On the motion to move the question, yes, 514, no, 32. That motion is adopted. So now we will go directly to a vote on Ms. Molden's main motion as amended by Mr. DaCosta's amendment. And what we are doing is shown as 125A2C. As shown, we are adding that to chapter 125A. A yes vote will adopt that motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. It requires a majority vote. And we are ready to vote. And voting is now open.
Voting is now closed on the main motion as amended by Mr. DaCosta on Article 69. Yes, 496. No, 73. That motion is adopted. So, zipping right along from nips to nipples. <laughs> Article 71. is on page 120 and 121 of the warrant. The Finance Committee's motion was a positive motion. It is as printed in the warrant. And I'll recognize Ms. Cronow for the purpose of making that motion. So moved, Madam Moderator. Motion is made and seconded. Now, Ms. Williams, you called this, but I'm going to ask Ms. Stover if she would like to do an introduction. All right, please. And Thank if you, you could state your name just for the record. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is Dorothy Stover. I'm going to share with you five facts. The history of bathing suits, chest anatomy, the difference between topless and nudity, the difference between sexual and sexualized, and current places in the U.S. where there's top freedom for all genders. Fact number one, history. Before the 1920s, all sexes wore pretty much the same bathing suits. It was made of wool material and completely covered the body. During the 1920s, bathing suits began to change significantly. Men and women began to wear bathing suits that covered their body less and less. The law at the time was that all sexes needed to have their nipples covered. Until 85 years ago, it was illegal for men to be topless at the beach. Between the 1920s and the 1947, men fought for their top freedom at beaches. In 1936, the men of New York staged an event where they, were, where they wore tops, or they didn't wear tops at the beach. This resulted in 42 men being arrested and fined. Men were told that being topless at the beach was not attractive, that, men, that people didn't want to see their hairy chests. They were told it was indecent, not family friendly, immoral, and disrespectful. Eventually, New York State was the first state to allow men to be topless at the beach in 1937. And over the next 10 years, other states within the USA began to pass top freedom for beaches at, for men. No one bats an eye now, except 85 years ago, this would have been shocking to most people. So, fact number two, chest anatomy. There are three different sexes. Someone's sex is different than their gender. Sex is the classification of sex organs one is born with, male, female, and intersex. Intersex people are born with a con configuration of both male and female reproductive organs. All sexes have nipples, areola, and mammary glands. Men can develop breast gland tissue as well as lactate. There are instances where men have lactated. Both during World War II, thousands of men reported lactation were held as prisoners either of Japanese POW camps or Nazi concentration camps. Men having cysts have reported lactation. There are several instances where fathers have chest fed their children when the mother is sick or has passed away. Additionally, spontaneous production of milk, not only associated with childbirth, can occur in both males and females. The difference between cis female and cis male chests is that mammary glands for cis males are not as developed and for the difference for women tend to have more fatty tissue. But this isn't necessarily the case. Cis men can have, tr have larger breast tissue than the average women and can lactate. Topless versus nudity. The definition of topless, wearing no clothing on the upper body. The meaning of nudity means showing of the human male or female genitals, pubic area, buttocks with less than a full opaque covering. Being topless is not being nude. This bylaw would not make beaches nude beaches. This bylaw would allow tops to be optional for anyone that chooses to be topless. Fact number four, sexual versus sexualized. The definition of sexual relating to or associated with sex, the definition of sexualized is a verb to render sexual, endow with sexual characteristics. Breasts are not inherently sexual, they are sexualized. Female breasts have been sexualized for generations. 
meaning others have found the breast to be sexy or a sexual function. But this is not always the case. 7.2% 7, of women said having their nipples stimulated decreases their arousal. If women's breasts are sexual, then let's also look at men's chests. 51.7% of cis men are sexually aroused by having their nipples stimulated. Only 7.5% of men have said that their nipple stimulation has decreased in their arousal. For something to be sexual, it's personal to themselves. The whole body can be a sex organ. There are endless ways to experience sexual pleasure throughout the entire body. It's personal. What one person may find pleasurable, another may not. What one person may find sexy, another may not. There are people that have sexualized ears, experience pleasure from having their ears stimulated, but that doesn't make, sexual, doesn't make ears sexual, it makes them sexualized. The main function of an ear is hearing. Fifth fact, current places where there is top freedom for equality for all genders. Wyoming, Utah. So these are all places where you can be topless no matter your gender. Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Kansas, Oklahoma. There was a Supreme Court decision that allowed it to be, that showed that it was unconstitutional for women to not have the right to be topless where a man can be topless. There are also cities where you're able to be topless. Madison, Wisconsin, New York City, Miami, Florida, Austin, Texas. Thank you, I appreciate your time, and I hope you vote for equality today. Thank you, okay. So Ms. Williams, you called this article. Call me a baby boomer. Call me on the dark side of 60. But when I first read this, I was outraged for my six grandkids. It should be up to my son and daughter-in-law and my daughter and her husband to decide what is appropriate and what isn't for them to see at the Jetty's Beach. And then I had to think about it. I have spent my entire, most of you know me, I've spent my entire life proving that women are as equal to men. And I was raised that way by my grandparents and I was raised that way by my father and my mother. And I just am outraged by this because if we have to go topless on the Jetty's Beach as opposed to Nudie Beach, which is down at the end of my road, knock yourselves out down there. You really don't want to see what's down there. But uh, some people who should not be naked are naked. But that's another situation. Um, I've spent my entire life trying to prove that and abiding by my parents and my grandparents' edict that you are just as good as a male. If I have to go topless to prove that I am equal to a male, there is something wrong with that concept. Because it's your actions, your stand on issues, your behavior, I've pounded nails, I've pumped gas, I have driven trucks, I've driven dump trucks and cement trucks and all kinds of stuff, so much for a prep school education. But those are what you do. It's your actions, your behavior, your mentality that proves that you are equal to any male and any male is not superior to any female. I don't need to vote in favor of going topless at the jetties to prove that we are equal in this world. So please vote this down. Thank you. Mr. Howard? Yeah, I am. Um, I have multiple, multiple thoughts on this. I appreciate what Ms. Williams just had to say. But I'm not sure that it comes down to a matter of whether or not it's uh, a matter of freedom for those versus the offense of others. I would like to share one of the most offensive moments and most com most uh, biggest dilemma I've run into both professionally and personally. Well, my, my sister had her kid about the same time I was working for ABC News. And there was a 2020 segment about wonderful advances in breast cancer treatments. And the promo for it we were working on and it was carefully, carefully sheeted off and the surgeon was there and it was a wonderful, wonderful topic and standards and practices asked us to put a black fuzzy wipe on it. And I couldn't figure out then, and I can't figure out now, how to explain to my nephew that which he was gaining life from was something that standards and practices or anybody else should continue 
to keep a shame loop going with. Obviously, it's voluntary. I've spent some time on the South Beach. I've seen families who have their kids out there, and they don't have any problem with it, and they're all clothed. I've seen the opposite. I think it's a matter of equality. And I, I, I look, why do I have these? What the hell are they? They're, they're non-functional. So what seems to be paradoxical to me anyway is that those that give life and that are of value and of joy are the ones that we're supposed to in some way discriminate against. That just, I mean, I, I understand the propriety issues. I understand what Ms. Williams has to say. There's part of me that feels that too. But when it comes down to the real, real nitty gritty on it as to what is and what is not fair, I don't think it's fair. I can do it, they can't. I don't get it. Thank you. Yes, the woman in the pink sweater. Uh, my name is B. Ganella, and I'd like to speak for the amendment. I think historically that Nantucket women have always practiced and lived gender equality, going back to Mary Starbuck, going back to Mariah Mitchell many years later. And Nantucket women had choices. Many of them decided to become entrepreneurs. They decided to run businesses while their husbands were away. Some of them even went to sea with their husbands. They had choices, and choice is a good thing. Now, I may not choose to go topless. God forbid everybody would run away. But I think other people should have that choice. And that um, it certainly has never caused a problem in Europe. It has never caused a problem in many South American countries, in, in the Caribbean. And I think that we should have that option to go choice, uh, to uh, go, if someone wants to get their top tanned, go ha have at it. And I would suggest that we vote for this so that we have choice. And then I'd say just go out and buy some stock in banana boat or something. <laughs> anyway, I hope you'll vote for this. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Zoda, and then I'll, I'll come over to you. Okay, this is my take. You need to get closer. We enact laws to keep people safe and for various reasons to live as a community of our choice. Right now on Nantucket, there are a number of beaches that people know you can go topless. It's sort of private. If you want to take your top off, I don't have a problem with it. But I don't think we need a law to make me feel equal to men so I can take my top off. I just, I just don't think it's necessary. I think we have other stuff to do. Thank you. Yes? I'm Peter Schaefer, and I'm speaking. I'm on the Finance Committee, but I'm speaking for myself, for my family. <clears throat> We've been coming here for 35 years. I brought my kids up in the summer. I brought my kids up. We've been living here full time for four years. I think it's absolutely absurd to think people are going to go to Jetty's Beach and take their tops off. If they want to take their tops off, they're going to go to a beach that's private. They don't want to go parading around. And quite frankly, when my kids were at, when we used to go to Ladies Beach with my kids, we didn't, it wasn't known as the nude beach then, um, and you asked somebody to put their top on because your kids were there, I don't ever remember anybody saying no. We also checked with the, or I didn't, I heard that, we checked, that there was checks done with the police, and there's never been a, a, a ticket or a summons issued for topless bathing in the Nantucket. So I think when you think about it, you know, we can stretch this out and say people are going to walk around the street with nude breasts. It's not going to happen. It's going to be exactly what's going on today. And it's just a matter of equality. Thank you. Yes. Go, go ahead, the woman in the blue sweater. Yes. Oh, me. Hi, I'm Marjorie Trott. Um, and I'm for this um, article, and apparently I'm having more trouble talking than I thought. Um, not only is it a matter of equality, it's a matter of normalizing. I think we should vote for it because an awful lot of, a lot of the time the only breasts, female breasts that anyone sees either are their own, their partners, or pornography on the internet, whether you want to or not, it's there. Kids are going to find it, all right? We see men's bodies all the time, whether we want to or not. 
Men can take their shirts off downtown. We're not even asking for that. We're just asking for the ability to take off our tops if we want to with the beach. You don't have to. You can wear head-to-toe costuming if you want. No one cares. The point is, if you allow female bodies to become normalized in all their shapes, all their sizes, the same way that men's are, everyone becomes safer. People grow up not expecting some idealized body. So not only does it promote equality for all of us, it pre creates better self-acceptance. Little boys don't grow up expecting their wives to look like what they saw on the internet. Women don't grow up, little girls don't grow up feeling horrible about themselves because they look down and it doesn't look like what they saw in the pictures. So just for general human health, as well as equality, I would urge everyone to please vote for this. And if you want to keep everything on, fine. If not, wear lots of sunscreen, because skin cancer sucks. Um, thanks. Thank you. Um, the woman up at the other microphone? No? I, I think she said it quite well. She's good. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Yes, thank you, Madam, Madam, Madam Op, <laughs> Moderator. Thank you for doing that. We needed that. Well, following your remark, it's tough to be funny. <laughs> the, uh, the word normalcy was just used by the prior speaker. Uh, I'm very concerned about the new normal. Um, I guess I'm an old dinosaur. I've been coming to Nantucket since 1975 with our family. And could By you way, state my, your name yes, for the record? Yes, I did. I'm sorry, I forgot. My name is Steve Rothke, the senior. Um, our kids came to Nantucket because we love the beaches. The beaches have always been one of the main focuses uh, that Nantucket has to offer. I think... It's ironic that the Boston Globe and national media have caught, have, have using the phrase, this is the topless beach island, or is about to become the topless beach island. I'm against this article for the same reasons that Ms. Williams and Mr. Schaefer stated. I think we have to focus on decency and sensibility rather than sensationalism. The island's at a crossroads now. Many of us think that it's going in the wrong direction. And to me, this is a very misguided article. I can't imagine what Fagawi weekend and July 4th weekend is going to look like at Surfside Beach and Navadir if this article passes. I think as a community, we should show where we stand on this article and overwhelmingly defeat it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can't come to you. I've got to go. I'm going to go to that one. OK, just Mr. Schaefer, go, go ahead. Go back to the microphone and just I'll, I'll allow you to do that as a point of personal privilege, I believe it is. Mr. Rothke um, spoke for me, and he was totally, that's not what I said at all. Uh, I don't know where he was when I was speaking that he thought I was in favor of, I mean, against this article. I am certainly in favor of this article, and, and I think I stated the reasons why before. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, the woman up in the back? Yes, thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is Mary Adair McCair, and I'd like to speak in support of this uh, amendment. And I'd like to speak to it in support for the, the juniors and the thirds that are going to be coming to Nantucket years from now and still enjoying it here, but not feeling titillated or embarrassed by a woman's body. Having women and men feel comfortable, just as Dorothy Stover talked about men winning the right to go topless at a beach. I don't see anything different about a woman also doing that. I think there'll be a hell of a lot of self-editing here. I don't think everyone's going to be going topless. And I think 
a couple generations from now, or maybe one generation from now, people will look at it as normal and healthy. And so I ask all of you to think about this in a way that makes it more comfortable to be in your skin and a better world for your children and your grandchildren to grow up in. Thank you. Please, Thank you. please vote for this. Yes, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, my name is Matt Tara. Um, I've sat here for now two days hearing this community talk about preservation, but also things about noise, um, crowds, density, ruckus, Bluetooth speakers, hot tubs. Um, and I think it's all in the name to preserve the quality of life here. And there's a lot of different opinions of that. Um, I support equality. I support us trying to bring other people along and support people who have less than us. But I think the main fear here as a father and someone who's been out at night in my younger days, I just feel as though this is opening a can of worms for which we may not be able to control. And there are two issues. It's really safety. I, I have seen what happens at Nobody Are. We call in state troopers to handle the volumes of people to arrest kids that are drinking underage. And I just think to myself, what would happen if one July 4th we had a group of girls who want to take their tops off? and they felt empowered to do so, rightfully so. But something happened, and how will we control that? And is that the kind of community that we wanna live in? And is that the kind of place that we wanna create? Um, my second point, I think there's ample opportunity on this island to be topless. And I don't think anyone really enforces it or cares if it's done appropriately. Um, and then lastly, we are gonna create a major attraction of Nantucket being the topless island on the East Coast. I would call it Daytona Beach of the East Coast, which feeds back to my first point. We talk about preservation. We talk about make sure the shingles are gray, the windows are the right windows. We talk about the right colors on our doors. Yet we're gonna pass something that would call undue attention to this island for the wrong reasons. So I encourage people to vote no. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, the woman in the back. Yes, Ada Ruth Wig. Uh, I just want to make a point of clarification. Um, the nude beach that's on the island is not actually a legal nude beach. It's an understanding that the town has. Under federal regulation 36 CFR 7.67, the female breast below a point immediately above the top of the areola has to be covered. And it applies to anyone over the age of 10. Um, and Anybody who would like to make any amendments to the article can certainly make it so that all persons have to be covered if they'd like to. Yeah, I think that would be beyond the scope, but <laughs> good idea. Um, I'm gonna go, over, I'm just gonna ping pong back and forth here. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Eve Messing. Um, first of all, to the gentleman who just spoke, um, I don't like to be compared to a shingle. My breasts are not shingles. Also to somebody who spoke first about uh, not feeling uh, that they should have to prove themselves by going topless, um, prove themselves equal to a man. Well, how about if I said, well, women should not have to prove themselves equal to men, so they should not have to vote either. Think about that sentence. Replace those words, they're equal. Also, um, I feel um, other people have said some great things about normalizing it. Um, kids, people are worried about their children. I think kids are the easiest ones to get over something. They're just like, oh, this is how it goes, okay. I mean, they're the ones who had to learn not to, they had, they're the ones who had to learn that it, to quit suckling on their mother's breast. Well, that's a bad thing. Had they never been told their mother had always been topless, it would have just been normal. So it's what they're taught. So it's really up to the parents also to teach respect for what they are seeing in the human body, whether it be male or female. That is up to the parents and the adults that seem to be having the hard time with this. 
As for beaches, yes, there is one unofficial beach, but maybe it isn't the beach that somebody wants to go to. Maybe they like the, uh, the shallow side, the calm side, or maybe they want to go where there's more waves. They have a right to those options, and maybe it's just simply not close to them. They want to go to a beach that's close to them. They should have the right to do that. And if they want to go topless. Now, this isn't saying everyone's going to do it. I bet there won't be that many. And if there is the first year, it's just out of fun. Um, you know, there will be maybe some growing pains, but that's just a part of life. You have growing pains. And then people get over. It gets normalized. No big deal. You know, it's a patch of skin about this big. It's the aerial we're talking about here. Thanks. Surrounded by some fat. That's all I have to say. I am for this. Thank you. Charity Grace Moffson. Um, I am fully supportive of this article. Um, <clears throat> someone said earlier that we have more important things uh, that we should be discussing or worrying about, and, and I somewhat agree. I think that this should be a no-brainer. Um, we shouldn't need to spend this much time debating about, about this. It's, 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 it's basic. Um, <clears throat> as far as safety, uh, um, women should not be punished for the potential criminal behavior of others. Um, criminal behavior should be addressed and criminals should be charged, period. And that's it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My <coughs> name is Lindsay Byrne. And I'd just like to speak uh, on behalf of this article. I'm very much in favor of it. Uh, I think that I've heard a lot of rhetoric that carries a lot of shame, <laughs> a lot of shame surrounding women's bodies, a lot of shame surrounding the idea of normalcy. And I think that allowing women to go topless is a perfectly normal behavior. All of us are mammals. We were fed on a mother's breast or some sort of supplement for it. Um, the more that we can normalize a behavior, the less shame it carries and the more accepted it is in public society so that it will, it will not be something that creates an attraction that is sensational. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. DaCosta? Wow, nipples, who knew? Um, Linda, I've gone toe to toe with you. You're a bigger man than most men I know, so <laughs> believe me, I'm not going down that road. Um, I think everyone in this room has probably already made their mind up how they're gonna vote on this, but I hate to do this to you, Sarah, but I gotta make an amendment to this article because I want, okay. a, I want an amendment to say that you can go on any beach you want with the exception of Children's Beach and Jetty's Beach. Those are two family beaches. Okay. They're downtown. One has a bar on it, which has Wait, issues. Before, so you, like before you talk, let me get the motion. So Mr. DaCosta is making a motion to amend um, Ms. Stover's motion by saying, are you ready? So it will be, whoops down at the bottom where it says, in order to promote equality for all persons, there, um, for all persons, any person shall be allowed to be topless on any public or private beach within the town of Nantucket, comma, except, whoops, children's beach with a capital C and a capital B, and Jetty's Beach. Is that your motion, Mr. DeCosta? That's my motion. Okay, is there a second? Motion is made and seconded. Mr. DeCosta. I got no problem with anybody pulling their nipples out and putting them on the beach. I just think these two beaches should be exempt. One is just a little kid's beach. The other one has a bar on it and whenever there's alcohol involved in topless. I've been to St. Martin, I had the uh, joy, I guess I'll call it, of taking four 16-year-old boys to St. Martin and experiencing what beaches with topless and bars were like, and I don't really want to go down that road again. I just, the South Shore, there's still the North Shore, you still go to Diona, you still go to 40th Pole, you can go calm water beaches, but these two beaches I would like to see exempt. And then 
then everyone can vote the way they're going to vote. I don't think we're going to change anybody's minds and everybody getting up and talking about equality and what you think of this or that. I think everyone's made their minds up in accord. Thank you. Okay, thank you. On Mr. DaCosta's amendment, Ms. Curnow. Thank you. I understand the logic behind Mr. DaCosta's amendment, and when we discussed it at Finance Committee, it was a thought I had that, per, but why don't we just pick a half a dozen beaches? And then I thought about Rosa Parks. She can only sit in the front on some buses. Equality is equality. Thank you. Okay. Um, Hi, Mary Bergman. I did have a question on this amendment, which is it reads that any persons can be topless except on children's beach. So what does that mean that men would not be able to be topless on children's beach and Jetty's beach? Because who is a person? Yeah, actually. So I would object to this <laughs> amendment. But I am in favor of the motion, and I do take objection to hearing that women's bodies are, uh, you know, indecent and anyway. I grew up in Provincetown and I turned out okay. You know, you can see a lot of things and anyway. So Mr. DaCosta, based on that very good um, pickup by Ms. Bergman, can I add in except that women shall not be allowed to be topless on children's beach you know what, Sarah? Beach? Here's a simple solution. I'm gonna withdraw my amendment, I'm gonna move the question. Oh, you don't get to do that. But you can withdraw your amendment. All right, I'm going to withdraw my amendment. Okay. Now can I raise my hand and move the question? No, we're just going to go to a vote. How about okay. that? Good, because I didn't want to have to really write that amendment. So, <clears throat> okay. So on the motion as printed in the warrant, a yes vote will adopt that motion, a no vote will defeat the motion, it requires a majority vote. A yes vote will adopt it. A no vote will defeat it. Voting is now open. One for yes, two for no. Voting is now closed. On, on the motion, the Finance Committee's motion is printed in the warrant, 327 yes, 242 no, that is adopted. Okay, um, Article 76 is very long. It starts on page 124. The motion picks up at page 131 and continues to page 138. Um, I would ask for your unanimous consent to waive the reading of that motion. And I will recognize Ms. Cronow for the purpose of making the Finance Committee's motion as printed in the warrant. So moved, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? Motion is made and seconded. Um, does anyone want to say anything about this, or should I go to, right to Ms. Sutton, who called it? Okay, Ms. Sutton? Uh, th thank you. I had just called this because I had a couple of questions, and I Can you get a little closer to the mic? Or maybe I can make it closer to me. Does that work? And talk yeah. a little louder. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so I had just a couple of questions about this and when it wasn't gonna be called, then I didn't feel like my questions were gonna get answered, so I just have questions. I don't have an amendment or anything. Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely, okay. ask, ask away. 
So um, in just some brief reading I've done, um, because I know this type of real estate transfer fee is up at the state and is also in other communities. And I believe this is for a half a percent on properties over $2 million, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I'm just wondering why we're not doing a little bit more. And the reason I ask is because sometimes I think if you start out high, it's easier to go lower. But if you start out at a half a percent and discover that it's really an effective um, trigger, which I think it will be, it becomes very difficult to increase um, in the future. So I was just sort of wondering what the thinking was behind the half a percent. I know the vineyard is going for 2%. I was thinking somewhere between one and one and a half, and I just was curious. Okay. Mr. Um, Holland? And I, I just want to mention in case you didn't notice it at the bottom of or at the bottom of the article on page 131 there's a list of the many times that this this um, article has been passed by this town meeting just just so you know this is something that's being brought back because it wasn't acted on by the legislature so right. go ahead mr right. Holland. Uh, thank thank you madam moderator um, so I, th I think the question is, why is it half a percent and not a greater amount? Is that correct? Yes. So to the point that you just made, Madam Moderator, this article has been voted on four previous times, first in 2016 and successively in 17, 18, and 19. In those latter three years, it was unanimously approved by this body, which I might add at this point, sends a strong signal to the legislature that this is something important to us. Um, and the half a percent is a result of this body deciding what would be appropriate for Nantucket. It might sound like a very small amount, but it adds up here. If had this been in place last year, it would have generated over $5 million. Those monies can then be used based on the history that we have with our land bank to bond. So in fact, these monies could be exponentially higher in a very short time frame. And believe it or not, it's not easy to responsibly spend 50 or $100 million. So the thought would be to do some smart things first, let people see how that money is put to work, and then this body can decide at a future point whether more is needed. Thank you. Super, thanks. So it sounds like this is just procedural. Yes. Right, right. okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holland. I did want to point out, thank you, Madam Moderator, two, um, two town meeting, there are two differences to what is in this warrant versus what we have voted on previously. The two differences are, one, we have increased the upper limit that these monies could serve up to 240% of area median income where it previously had been at 175%. And basically this matches what a town like Aspen, Colorado has been doing for 30 years. It's not only folks at the capital A affordable level that struggle to afford homes here on the island. I think we are all well aware of that. The second difference here to prior votes is because of the state enabling legislation that is simultaneously going uh, through the state house and being considered and which may well be the actual vehicle that would allow us to implement a transfer fee for housing, town council has inserted a paragraph in here that basically says if one of those state enabling pieces of legislation passes, 
consider this our raising our hand to participate in that so that we do not have to wait for a future town meeting to get involved. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So on the motion on Article 75, seeing no one at any of the microphones, I think we are ready for a vote. Article 76, I'm sorry. Um, a yes vote will adopt the Finance Committee's motion as printed in the warrant. A no vote will defeat that motion. It does require a majority vote, although as Mr. Holland said, the closer we are to unanimity, the better it is when we go to the state. So we are ready to vote. Voting is now open. One is yes, two is no. Voting is now closed on the Finance Committee's motion on Article 76. Yes, 405, no, 99. That motion is adopted. Okay. Article 78. Um, Article 78 starts on page 139, continues for a number, a lot of pages, continues all the way to page 148. And I will, I will ask for your unanimous consent to waive the reading of that motion. And I'll recognize um, Ms. Cronow for the purpose of making the Finance Committee's motion as printed in the warrant. So moved, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Second. Thank you. That motion is made and seconded. Um, Ms. Sutton, I believe you called this. Thank you again for your time. Sorry, I'm getting a little hoarse here. Um, so I was on the town government study committee and the title of this is an act amending the charter of the um, town of Nantucket to implement certain recommendations of the town government study committee, which I'm all for. There is one section, however, that I think should be um, removed from, and I believe there is an amendment to do it. And, I'm reading on page um, 140, so the highlighted section of Article 2, Section 2.5, Town Meeting Warrant, which is this, this booklet we receive. Um, section D, notwithstanding any general or special law to the contrary, the select board shall insert in the warrant for the annual meeting, all subjects the insertion of has been requested of them in writing by 50 or more registered voters of the town, and in the warrant for every special town meeting, all subjects the insertion of which has been requested of them in writing by 100 registered voters. That's your citizen's articles, which currently are in line with the majority of open meeting town um, procedures throughout Massachusetts. Um, I did do some research on this when I was on the 
Town Government Study Committee. The Government Study Committee had recommended, had had a robust discussion and had re recommended in its final report um, by a four to two vote out of the committee was 25 signatures. I feel when I read this, I felt like this is completely out of nowhere and did not come from our recommendation of that committee. I was one of two people who voted against it as I believe that it, um, it, it's in, un, perhaps unintended intent um, or consequence is to reduce participation in the democratic process that we have. Um, I'm fully and 100% against that. I don't believe that there was any robust discussion on the 50, therefore I believe it's arbitrary and capricious, and if they would like to make a change from what the um, accepted Massachusetts general law is in part one, title seven, chapter 39, section 10, where it reads the select men, which it should probably be select people, or select board shall insert in the warrant for the annual meeting all subjects, the insertion of which shall be requested of them in writing by 10 or more registered voters of the town, and in the warrant for every special town meeting all subjects, the insertion of which shall be requested of them in writing by 100 registered voters or by 10% of the total number of registered voters of the town, whichever number is lesser. Um, so. So that, you, that is something that I had found afterwards. And so I believe that what is happening is appropriate. They do have the ability to do a home rule petition to get a special act to increase the um, number of signatures needed for citizens' articles to the warrant to above 10. However, um, I think 10 is appropriate at this time. There, in my research for the Government Study Committee. Ms. Uh, Ms. What? Can I just stop you for a second? So are you making, you're making a motion to delete section D. I am. Okay, let's just do that quickly. You're, that's your motion. So yes. Just say so moved. Oh, so moved. Is there a second? Okay, now go, go ahead and talk about it. Okay. So I just wanted to get the motion formally up there. Okay, my apologies for that, um, that's okay. not getting I, that. I was looking stuff up, so I wasn't, go ahead. So in my um, responses or my notes to the committee, um, I made a number of them um, based on various research that I had done and participating in the committee's work for two and a half years. Um, I also, so some of the things that I found, and this is just what I noted to the committee, some towns, de and I believe Andover may be one of them, some towns deem the select board as the arbiter of what articles can be included in the warrant. So in other words, you don't need to have signatures. You can just submit your petition and then the, um, the select board decides whether that issue is going to go in or not. Um, it seems a little burdensome, but that is uh, one way some towns um, adjust to it. The majority of open meeting law towns, and I would say a super majority of open meeting um, town laws, uh, follow the states, what I just read earlier. Those are other towns such as Sutton, Grafton, Groton, Hingham, um, and many more follow that model. I'm sorry. And I just wanted to bring that up because, again, I, I was just startled beyond startled. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. OK. On Ms. Sutton's amendment. Uh, yes, Mr. Atherton, and then I'll go to you, Mr. Bridges. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. <clears throat> I also sat on the Government Study Committee. I was one of the two no votes on this section of our report. Um, I was willing to go to a compromise, but it wasn't 50. Uh, 
And under these circumstances, I appreciate Campbell pointing this out to us. I'm sorry I missed it. And a town meeting is a special treasure for Nantucket. And I know a lot of people uh, want to make sure we maintain all our rights as citizens to participate. And this is one of those areas where some people say, oh, the article's frivolous, get rid of it. We want uh, 50 or 100 to make sure the article is well vetted or something. Um, I think what that takes away is a lot of articles that come here that are really well-meaning, people care about them, and if you don't appreciate them, you can vote against them. But I am against going to the number in this section D, and I'm supporting Campbell's amendment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I just want to point out in the text, there are two places where this gets stricken. It's stricken on page 144 down near the bottom, and then it appears again a little ways down on page 147. Section 5 would be stricken. And then the other sections would be, if this is passed, would be renumbered after that. OK. Um, I said I would go to Mr. Bridges, and then I'll go to you, Mr. Barina. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, the, uh, let's see here. The Town Government Study Committee recommended 25, and the Select Board discussed it in open session and decided to up it to 50 to just raise the bar a little bit, which is similar to when you're running for an elected position. You have to have around the same amount of votes, or sorry, um, signatures. The, the downside of this is for the town clerk's office because they have to look at more, they have to look up more uh, names and addresses. But we felt this was more appropriate and it also gets, um, it kind of forces someone to get out the vote and ask for more people. So it's asking more, more outreach. So I think it was unanimous uh, from the board, I believe, at 50. Thank you. Mr. Perrotta? Uh, yes, Madam Moderator. Um, I have a question regarding the timing on this. Does this mean that the citizen articles can close, and if I were to introduce an article after a citizen article and bring it to the select board to have it added with their stuff, which closes in January, would that mean that this would be included after a citizen article closes? I'm just trying to understand the timing of how no. this works into the system. I believe that what this is doing is the citizens' articles that open in the fall. Yes. Those would now require, instead of 10 signatures, they'd require 50. And for a special, they'd require 100. You still have the option, as you do today, although I don't think it's exercised all that often, you do have the option of going to the select board before their warrant closes and asking them to put something on the warrant for you. Correct. It doesn't would, happen very frequently. It doesn't happen frequently, but would that be if you had the 50 signatures and you asked for it after a closing, that you would be able to request that to be added? Just want a little clarification because sometimes citizen warrant articles close and then the town comes up with an article that we as citizens don't get a chance to counter or work with. So I just wanted to see if there was, in regard to that, would that mean 50 could be at the 50 signatures, and then we can Mr. add it to their batch? Mr. Giorgio, the, the, ar the articles that the select board agrees to put on the warrant don't have a signature requirement, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So there, there's no signature requirement for articles that the select board puts on the warrant but the select board is not required to put anything on the warrant that it doesn't want to. Okay, thank you, Madam Moderator. Sure. Yes. Hi, Madam Moderator, Carl Linval. Um, I just think that having 10 signatures is not enough. Um, you know, it, it, it's pretty easy to get 10 friends together to support your article, but if you really want a true litmus of the community, I agree that 50 and 100 are the appropriate numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
So Ms. Sutton's amendment requires a majority vote. I think we're ready to vote. A yes vote will adopt her amendment. Her amendment would strike in two places the language including the requirement of 50 signatures for an annual town meeting and 100 signatures for a special town meeting. A no vote will defeat that amendment. We are ready to vote. Voting is now open. One for yes, two for no. Voting is now closed. On the amendment, yes, 202, no, 252, the amendment is not adopted. On the motion of the Finance Committee as printed in the warrant on Article 78, is there any further discussion? No. Okay, then I think we're ready to vote on that as well. It also requires a majority vote. A yes will adopt that motion. A no will defeat the motion. Voting is now open. One for yes, two for no. Voting is now closed. On the main motion, yes, 360, no, 91. That motion is adopted. Okay. Article 79 is on 148 of the warrant, continues to page 149 where the Finance Committee motion is. It is a positive motion. The motion is as printed in the warrant. I'd ask for your unanimous consent to wa waive the reading. And I will recognize Ms. Kronow for the purpose of making that motion. So moved, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? second. Motion is made and seconded. Now, I know Mr. DaCosta wants to talk about this, but is there anyone on, who wants to make the pitch for this main motion first? No. Okay, then I will go to Mr. DaCosta. So you have my amendment up there, Sarah. Um, we, the amendment requests that this go to, this gets a positive recommendation, and we ban fertilizers in Nantucket. I'll give you a little history. I've had a scallop license on my own since 1980. Wait, before you... Oh, do this. Let me you make a motion to amend it as you okay. need a second. And so your motion basically is to go back to the original text of the article. And take it to the MP and EDC. Okay. All right. And that motion is seconded. So now you can go ahead. Okay. So I've had a scallop license in the town of Nantucket since 1980, but I started scalloping in 19. 70 with my parents at the age of 11. I've been scalloping every winter since then. I was in front of this board 
or this body in 2012 when we came in for the first original request to ban fertilizers and we compromised with the fertilizer regulations that we have now. Since then, a lot of things have happened. I served for two terms on the Board of Selectmen. One of the things that I was very proud of getting done while I was on the board with the help of my other board members was getting uh, the harbor, uh, most of the harbor watersheds sewered, Monomoy, Shimo, that area. Um, at this time, almost 100% of those houses are hooked into the sewer. The jetties were raised, increasing the velocity of water going in and out of the harbor. We are uh, known on the East Coast as pumping out more raw sewage from the boats that come in this harbor than any other harbor on the East Coast. Um, Sheila could give you the numbers, but it's staggering how much waste we take out. Um, that being said, we still have a problem in the harbor. Nitrogen loading has not gotten better. It's gotten slightly better, but it's still bad. We've done everything that we can do with the exception of one thing, and that's fertilizer. I, I didn't want to have to come here and go down to this extreme level, but from what I can see, the regulations are not working. Uh, the town is, has its hands tied by the ability to go on private land and enforce fertilizer regulations, and from what I can tell, from what I can see, it's not, it's not being done. We did an underwater survey of the harbor this year. Um, one, of the, one of the commercial divers went through and videoed it. The south side of the harbor, which is closest to all the houses, has the worst nitrogen loading and, and algae bloom of anywhere in the harbor. The north side, on the CO2 side, where there's no development and no green grass, is much better off. We're at critical mass here. If we don't do something soon, we're not going to have a scallop fishery anymore, a fishery that's been going on in this island for well over 100 years. I put a pretty big target on my back with the landscaping community on this by pushing this, but I'll, I'm, I'm going to say this. Uh, I've talked to some landscapers. Well, I've gotten th some pretty nasty emails and texts from landscapers who are against this, but I've also gotten calls and texts who, from landscapers that are want to be held off the record that have said they hope this passes because they have homeowners right now who said, I don't care about regulations or fines. I want my lawn to be as green as it can be, and if you won't do it, I'll find somebody else who will. That's a pretty sad statement that you got to have your waterfront home, your multi-million dollar home, and the grass has to be so green that you, you know, so you can say my green, my lawn is greener than my neighbor's. I never fertilized my lawn in 30 years. It's green. It's not as green as some of the, my neighbors are, but that's fine. I'm good with it. I drive through Alta Rock, Tom Nevers, all these areas where everything's wild. Plenty of stuff grows without fertilizer. I'll put it to you this way. If we don't do something to save the eelgrass in the harbor, I'm going to be out of business in five years. If you stop fertilizing lawns, the landscapers aren't going to be out of business. The grass is still going to grow. The bushes are still going to grow. Everything's going to need to be mowed and cut. It might not need to be mowed three times a week, but it's still going to need to be mowed. I would urge everyone to vote for this. I think it's a lot, you know, we, this is the last thing that we can control when it comes to nitrogen loading. I'm not saying that fertilizer is the only problem, but I'm saying it's one of the things that we can control. Sewerage was one, we took care of that. The jetties was one, we could took care of that. Fertilizer is the next, the next item on the block. I can't control how much birds there are. I can't control global warming. I can't control a lot of things that are natural, but these are things that we can control. Um, I would, town council is going to say that this won't get through the state house. Well, that may be, but we just passed the home, uh, home rule petition for the fourth time on housing. So let's send it up there and see what they say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the gentleman over here on the left. Hi, my name is Ken Panasak. Uh, been landscaping for 40 years on island, off island. Been in agriculture for just as long, farming, all those things. Uh, one thing I've learned is to follow the science. And as I stand here, I have reports from an independent laboratory on soil tests I've taken from various parts of the island. And according to these soil tests from a certified qualified laboratory that specializes in these things, we have deficiencies in various parts of the island. When you go to the south side of the island, 
I have recommendations to apply 2.3 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. I have recommendations to apply 1.7 pounds of phosphate. That's phosphate. That's pretty much banned in the BMP unless you can prove through soil tests otherwise that it's needed. Um, and then also potassium. We're short up to five or six pounds of potassium per thousand square feet. Now this is actual science. This is not feelings, emotions, um, unlike what Bob brings to the table. So I guess it's time we start to follow the science and not follow the emotion. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Mr. Ray. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Richard Ray, for those of you who don't know me, the, uh, I'm the individual that wrote the body of the original fertilizer regulations for this island. And I will admit that enforcement was certainly a part of those regulations, but it turned out to be something that we could not accomplish with the minimal staff that we had. We took our best shots, but it just simply didn't work for us. This, I like. It's a no, you can't do it. There's no question that fertilizer, fertilizer use on this island is extravagant. You can see the iridescent green in so many lawns. Please vote this article in. I think it's a good response for harbor water quality. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, Jesse Dutra, uh, landscaper, and um, I'm going to get some more arrows at my back to my peers here because I am going to. I am for this article, and with some exceptions, which maybe we can uh, write in. Um, I can't see. I can't tell you how many times I see these beautiful green lawns with street drains right on the end of the street, and, and the fertilizer going running down the hill right into the street drains. It's impossible to regulate, which we've witnessed so far. And um, I, um, I'm, in, and I'm, 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 and I am. My father is a fisherman. Um, he's a lobster boat captain, scallop person here. I grew up when with the live. That was our livelihood. That's how we got food on our table. And I'm, I'm, I find food on. The, so I see both sides of the table here. And what I see is us as landscapers can very much still have food on the table. If you have sell healthy soil and you keep it moist, you're going to be cutting your grass every week. No, it might not look like the uh, golf course, but it is still a healthy soil. Um, and you're still cutting the grass. But it, and I, don't, I can't tell you if the, the, the us landscapers are the problem. I, I, I really don't know that. I, I, I don't know if, if we ban this, that this is actually going to cause a fix the problem. There's a very good chance that is not going to cause a fix the problem. But if there is a chance, I think we should, we should go in that direction because the fisheries are extremely important. Our soil health is extremely important. And I think that it's um, more important than how many times we can cut our grass per week. Um, with that, there is an exception, and I feel like maybe we can write this in, is establishment. Plants need f fertilizer to be established. Whether it's a new lawn or a tree being planted, they need to have that little bit of uh, life of fertilizer to allow to grow. So I'd like to see something in this article that allows maybe for the first year for a lawn or a tree to be established that they can have fertilizer. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Engelborg. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Seth Engelborg, I'm speaking only on behalf of myself. I think that although there are issues with an outright ban and a home rule petition to the state, I think that this sends an impactful message for the community of Nantucket about the ecosystems and the harbor watersheds that we want. Uh, I think there are some issues with the process. We do have alternative um, you know, areas we can look to refine fertilizer regulations, but I think we need to strongly and impactfully send a message that uh, the current uh, effort to use fertilizer here on island isn't working for our community or our ecosystem. So I strongly uh, suggest that you go forward with this. Let it see, see let's, let us see what happens in the, in the legislature and in the courts and uh, go from there. I think that this is an extremely impactful step to protecting our harbor water quality and our watershed. 
If you look at Nantucket, it's unique, it's special. We have rare species, rare ecosystems. Almost the entire uh, body of the island is in a watershed district or in a natural heritage and endangered species uh, program district. And I think that although I, am, I hear what the landscapers are saying, I think we need to really do this so that we can ensure a positive future, not just for our commercial fishers, but for our recreational fisheries and for our ecosystem protections in general. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dutra, if you want to make that as an amendment, could you come down and talk to town council so we can get something drafted? I can't do it on the fly, but if you want to put it in, I'll take it. So go, go ahead back at the back, Mike, yes. Thank you. My name is Jim Cook. Uh, I'm an arborist, and my job is to take care of the trees. Um, today I feel like the Lorax. I'm speaking for the trees. As you all know, nitrogen is considered the most important component for supporting plant growth. Nitrogen is part of the chlorophyll molecule which gives plants their green color, and it's involved in creating food for the plant through photosynthesis. We've taken thousands of soil samples throughout the island. Sometimes nitrogen is needed, and sometimes it's not. I took this soil sample two weeks ago, uh, mid-island. Nitrogen was low, phosphorus was high, potassium is low, pH is too alkaline, organic matter is low, Manganese and boron are both very no low. I see that soil sample a lot. But every soil sample is unique and it's important to take it. When we are doing prescription fertilizer, we take all the macros, micronutrients, pH, CEC, organic matter levels into consideration. And then with staying in the BMP, we fertilize to fix these deficiencies. If fertilizers are banned, it won't affect me. I'll still breathe, I'll eat sandwiches, I'll drink water, I'll sleep, I'll be fine. But I'm speaking for the trees. I take care of a lot of trees for the people in this room and on the island. The nitrogen is sometimes a part of the prescription that is used to fix the soil deficiencies. Not always, but sometimes. If we looked at the soil sample analysis and regulate the fertilizers that can be used, we can continue to take care of the trees and not negatively affect the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Goss? This gentleman is speaking. Up, oh, over here? OK. Yes. Her Herschel Allerhan. Uh, I'm not talking about the science of it. I don't know enough to know what the, whether we should ban all nitrogen or not. The part of the problem from what I'm hearing is from the owners of homes. And they're the ones that seem to be pushing the landscapers. Why don't we try a different way? Why don't we try shaming? What I would suggest is that we work out some sort of procedure where we write up what it is that we want and we make it known to the little people who come here who want these supposedly very green lawns. Let them know that there are people here that are upset with it and let's see if we can work it from the other side where you might not have to go to the, uh, to the House of Representatives or to Boston and where we could work from over here and let people feel uncomfortable if they have this great green lawn and pushing the landscapers. Give the landscapers uh, some sort of protection by saying uh, where they can give something to the homeowners in writing from the town saying that this is not what we want. Thank you. Ms. Goss? Hi, I'm, is it on? Um, I'm Vicki Goss and I've been a landscaper also. I prefer a gardener, but there it is, um, for 40 years. And the oldest and wisest gardeners that I've ever read have said feed the soil, not the plant. And you feed the soil with nutrients. Compost is great, manure is great. Um, peat or leaf matter, leaf mold, anything like that is great. That's all just natural food. Um, your trees that are growing in the forest, that's what they're eating. They're eating the droppings from the birds, um, you know, just the natural life around them. You see the poison green lawns all around the edge and you can see in the harbor 
what they're killing. You can see the algae on the ponds, what that's killing, and that's the nitrogen. Nitrogen is constantly added because nitrogen constantly washes away. And that's the science part of it. You're washing away your nitrogen with every rain, with every irrigation. And then you have to add more, and then it all watersheds again down into the harbor. So um, feed the soil, skip the fertilizer, and uh, support this article. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Madam Moderator. You. My name is uh, Brian Borges, and I'm a fisherman out here. I've actually wanted to speak on a lot of articles tonight, um, but I didn't want to uh, dilute my words. Um, we have one harbor here. Um, Jesse even said, this might not work, it might not be about fertilizer, but what if it is? And if we go another five years, and we, ha we have a 3,200 bushel um, harvest this year, 12 years ago, Smitty and I harvested 1,300 bushels by ourselves, one boat. What, what about October 1st? What about push raking? What about like the best part of Nantucket is our harbor, our health, our island, our water? Like green lawns, if nobody has a green lawn on this island, if nobody has a green lawn, everyone is okay. Everyone's life is still great. If we have one disgusting, horrible, unusable harbor, everyone's life is wrong. It's, it's super important to try to do this. I'm, so against banning everything on this island because we, we're just going to ban everything at some point. But we need to have responsible use. There is definitely nitrogen deficiencies and phosphorus deficiencies. The guy from the Bartlett Tree Expert, guy's a smart dude. He is not incorrect. But unless we have the ability to make everyone be a responsible host to this island, the only way we can do it is wipe it out. We just did it with NIPS, right? I, I get a whole bunch of little Casamigos nips and I drink them, I throw them in the trash. You know what I don't get is those nips because the other people can't be responsible. So what we have to do is put a blanket over this and just like give us five years. I'm, I know we have to go to the state and all that stuff, but give us five years. And if it doesn't work, then we'll come back and work at this again. But if it does work, what is the upside? The upside is everything. The upside is our harbor, it's our scallops, it's our shellfish, it's our ability to go swimming without that green, nasty slime. It's our ability to throw dredges in November without worrying about like, not even being able to, to catch one scallop. So I think, I think I speak really in favor of this. And trust me, I take every single landscape and fishing on this whole island. And you know what? I'm, I'm speaking against my business right now. I'm speaking for the harbor and for Nantucket Island. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to Mr. Dutra and just get your motion to amend Mr. DaCosta's amendment out there. Mr. DaCosta? Sarah, I, I have no problem adding that as a friendly amendment. If we don't, then we won't have to debate it if that's all right. Okay. That's fine with me. If you're fine with it, I'm fine with it. Okay. So now the motion is we as made by Mr. Month. DaCosta with... Mr. Dutra's friendly amendment that adds, except that fertilizer shall be allowed during the first year of plant establishment after proper soil testing. Yes. What is proper soil testing? Mr. Dutra, what is proper soil testing? Could you go to the microphone? If Sarah, I think we're going to have to debate this because that's one question I can't answer. And so that's, that's easy. I, um, people want to speak on this, so. Yeah. OK, well, let me let, go ahead, Je Jesse, go ahead. Um, by UMass Amherst. OK. Go ahead. Hi. Sorry. Um, my name is Mark Lucas. I'm the golf course manager at Nantucket Golf Club. I can answer that question. It's in the BMP. It's a, okay, and, the, and tell them what the BMP is. Best Management Practices for Nantucket. Okay. I was part of the original Article 68 work group, and I hoped I didn't have to talk tonight. Um, someone just said five years, let's see where we're at. Golf courses won't exist in five years if this passes. Um, I think there's a chance it could pass tonight, but I'd like to ask town council, what do you think the chances are that it passes at the state level?
Uh, Madam Moderator, um, the only th thing I could say in answer to that question is I believe it was 2012, this town meeting passed a very similar home rule petition to ban fertilizer. That, that was not acted on that, okay. by the legislature. Right. So it went to this. It went to the legislature, but it was not enacted. Right. And correct me if I'm wrong, but we. I'm not sure who did it. Whether it was the board of actually the board of health was the select board at the time. Correct. Um, we formed a work group, and Bob DeCosta could probably help answer this as well. But I want to ask if this passes tonight, will our current regulation still be in effect? I think I know the answer, I just want you to confirm it. Yes. That's good because I think this will fail at the state level. And I wanna make sure that the, the current regulations that we have are still enforced. We haven't had education uh, sponsored by the town since 2016 or 2017. That's part of the regulation right now. I'm on the Fertilizer Advisory Board. We provided that education. It was filmed. Now that's part of the training program to get licensed, but that's it. There's no education. There's nothing happening. We need more support from the town. I mean, these regulations are strong. They were done in conjunction with UMass, UConn, Cornell. So if you th I guess it's be careful what you wish for. And I have one more question for you. The board are, so if you say the regulations are still in effect, that means everything, all of it, right? Can the Board of Health still change the regulations? And if, if not, why not? That's my last question. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> Madam Moderator, in, in 2014, the state... Um, can, John, can you put that closer to your mouth? Yes, uh, the, the state passed us um, a law that um, limited the ability of municipalities to enact uh, fertilizer regulations that are more stringent than those that are uh, adopted by the Department of Agriculture. So the answer to your question is, any change in the regulations would have to be approved by the Department of Agriculture and could not be more stringent than what currently exists under the state regulations. Just to follow up, go, go ahead. Our current, re our current regulations are more strict than the Department of Agriculture. The, some, I, it's possible that, that they're most strict in the state. Mr. Miserelli, I think. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Mike Miserelli, uh, owner of J&M Landscape Services and a fertilizer advisory member as well. Um, I'm not going to take up a lot of everybody's time because a lot of the points that I wanted to mention have already been um, addressed, but the, the article is originally drafted by Mr. Manila cited, which is where we are now. It didn't cite any scientific evidence that our current guidelines are a failure. While very recent water quality reports by the town show improving trends, these are on the town's website, moderate to high quality water conditions, and that we are on target to accomplish total maximum daily loads for nitrogen. I know there's a lot of people that'll disagree with me, but to me, that says that the fertilizer guidelines are making an impact. It seems quite a stretch to exclude all trees, shrubs, and home gardens on the island from nutrients they need to survive. I truly believe that will create a more harmful environment going forward. Um, you know, the amended version of the article, which we're not even considering at this moment, the, it doesn't seek to prohibit fertilizer, the amended one, but the, our, our BMP, as it stands right now, addresses compost and manure. Um, that, you know, that's gonna, that would go away under a fertilizer ban. You just have to be careful about spreading nutrients all over the place in replacement of fertilizer. We have a fertilizer, fertilizer advisory board in place that can amend regulations through the Board of Health and the NP and EDC. The town of Falmouth attempted such a regulation in two thir 2013 
uh, and was turned down by by the courts in Boston, citing Chapter 262, which Mr. Giorgio just just addressed. Um, if we think it's difficult now to enforce the regulations, it's going to get more difficult as to, if we prohibit it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sanford? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Henry Sanford, private citizen. I'd just like to point out this is amendment, um, except that fertilizer shall be allowed during the first year of plant establishment after proper soil testing. Uh, that's a loophole waiting to happen. I'll just plant something every week. If I just plant something every week, now I can use fertilizer. So I just wanted to point that out, that we should be thinking about someone who says, plant, put fertilizer on my lawn or are we going to fire you? Well, they'll look at that and probably say, great, just plant a hydrangea once a week or, hey, how about every time you mow my lawn? Because money's no issue, right? I mean, I just think that that's, I get what he's trying to do, but I think someone's going to see that as a loophole. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carlson? Uh, you can go to Ms. Oh, Ms. Williams? I think there's an unintended consequence here. All my kids played on those fields at the high school. And I'm not exactly sure what the impact's going to be by passing this on all of the fields, the Delta fields, the uh, nobody or field that's not turf, since we're not allowing turf fields at the high school at the moment because of those concerns about toxins. We're going to have to keep those fields, the soccer field, the baseball fields, the football fields, in operating shape. So I don't think anybody has thought about that at the unintended consequences on those fields, number one. Number two, I'm not, I have a lunar surface for 40 years, so I don't do anything with fertilizer. My septic tank is green. Um, is there, are there uh, materials that are non-toxic that can be used that would not impact the water quality? And I know having a discussion years ago, um, after they passed that first group in 12, that there was gonna be needed to be more staff to police the green grass close to the harbors and the, and the ponds. There wasn't, they don't have enough staff now to, to waste going after all these people. The education co uh, component of this, I spoke to a lot of landscapers, some in the family, there's no education getting out to them all the time when the, they have staff turnovers, they have new landscapers. So I think it's a combination of enforcement of the original and it's a combination of the lack of education for those new ones. But I just wanted everybody to think about the impact on the high school playing fields and I don't, and the answer to their non-toxic things that they can be used that isn't going to cause this kind of a, uh, an impact, especially in that scalloping. Thank you. Ms. Molden, and then I'll come back down to you, Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Emily Molden for the Nantucket Land Council. The Land Council has been a part of the movement to restrict fertilizer on Nantucket since the 90s, and excessive fertilizer use definitely impacts our water quality. We helped create those best management practices that were adopted and incorporated into the Board of Health regulations in 2012, and it is unfortunate that we're here again talking about the need for further restrictions. A number of island landscapers and turf professionals, some of whom have spoken tonight, also worked very hard on creating regulations that were backed by science, were fair, and would make a difference. These individuals have worked really hard to live up to the standards of the BMPs and the regulations, but there are also many others that have not. We're supporting the Home Rule petition to ban fertilizer across Nantucket because while we recognize that the town has taken steps to implement this program, we don't believe the BMPs and the regs have been supported as needed to make them effective. There is more that the Land Council and other island institutions can do to support community education, but the education and licensing program that our local regulations require the town to administer need more attention and need greater effort around enforcement. Our local regulations, as you heard, are in full force in effect. And if there are changes that are necessary to improve them, we believe there are mechanisms in place to do so. So we're urging voters to support the fertilizer ban, to send a clear and resounding message to the town to make the fertilizer regulation program and the water quality of our harbors and ponds a top priority. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carlson? Sure, thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Moderator. Jeff Carlson, the 
Natural Resource Director for the Town of Nantucket. Uh, and I just want to try to provide some clarity to some questions and some concerns that have come up tonight, um, and then hopefully be, be a resource for, for some of that information. So um, to be clear for everybody, the educational program had scheduled classes all the way into 2020 when that schedule ceased uh, to the COVID-19 outbreak. We were licensing individuals and offered our normal classwork through, through video trainings and things that were from a field-based class that was offered through the Fertilizer Advisory Committee all the way through 2019. And then pulled together data today, um, our inspections from 2016 through the COVID outbreak where the enforcement gets a little muddy for inspections because we're including it with general checks for COVID-19 compliance. So we didn't really break out fertilizer from COVID. But in that stretch, uh, the Natural Resources Department and Board of Health did over 850 inspections during that time. So we've been out and we've been there and, and I will be the first to agree and, and stand in front of everyone and say, there are a lot of really great citizens that do the right thing by the BMP. There are a lot of landscapers that do their best, that follow the rules, that ask questions and provide resources to, to people that are there. Um, but we're also dealing with, you know, kind of a cultural change in practice and that has growing pains and issues that go with it. And, you know, I think we all hear loud and clear that there are issues with the current structure and current program and we understand that. And I, I think the fact that we can come together and have the debate and, and hear the concerns of the community, I think is, a really great step for us and a great great instruction for us and uh, we're happy to do the will of town meeting to try to put the best program forward that we can and if anyone has any other questions about our level of effort or things that have been going on I'd be happy to try to provide any further information okay I'm gonna go over here I'm just trying to get some people who haven't spoken already so hey thank you my name is Lucy Lesk and I write the Gardening by the Sea column in the Inquire and Mirror, among other things. I've been living on Nantucket since 1979, and one of the very first things I ever did here was start a garden. I've had a garden here for a long time, and I have been... You didn't mean it that way. You got physical... Oh, can you turn okay. off my timer, please? Could, Excuse me. Could we I have to file a complaint? I just was assaulted by Mr. DeCosta who decided to poke me in the chest because okay. he doesn't agree with me. No. Okay. Now, that's physical conflict. Let's, the last let's, person okay. Me, you don't need to hear him. Can we have a constable please come yes. and um, escort oh, no. settle no. this um, debate, please? Thank you. Yeah, and I want to say, yeah, and you pushed me. You poked me in the chest. You physically assaulted me. I want you removed. I want my right to speak. Maybe you could take it outside and and I don't know. Sorry, sir. Okay. I'm sorry, Mrs. Lesk. You should go ahead and and finish your. Thank you. Feel f I think you should feel free to to reboot there. Okay. Ready? Uh, I love this town. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I love this island, and I love all the plants on it. Um, I'm support of this article for um, one reason, and that is that we have to start actually doing what we say we're going to do. And this could, again, send a very strong message um, to ourselves that we need to get serious about this. Um, I have a lot of problems with this article, too. It needs a lot of work. For example, just two, uh, three things. What is the definition of fertilizer? What is the definition of farming? What is the definition of application? Is it inside? Is it outside? 
What if my mother heads to Home Depot and smuggles a jar of milk will grow home in her pocketbook? I mean, there are a lot of problems with this article. I recognize that, but there's a spot in the article that says, um, refer to the, um, uh, to the, authorize the general court with the approval of the select board to make the changes in form to the text as may be necessary or advisable in order to secure or accomplish the intent and public purpose. It needs a lot of work, but let's get started. This is a huge problem. There were so many beautiful things growing here all by themselves without fertilizer for 10,000 years. They'll grow here again. We can do it. I just want you to know I'm putting my money where my mouth is this year. I'm ripping, I ripped out my front lawn. I ripped out all the hydrangeas. I ripped out all the daylilies. I'm tired of feeding the deer. There's so many, so many problems with the fertilizer application we have today. It's time to start doing something about it, and we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone who hasn't been heard? Oh, Mr. Lowell. Excuse me? Yeah, point of order? Yeah, no, that's not a point of order. You have to be in a microphone for that. So, Mr. Lowell, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Andy Lowell, Chairman, Harbor Shellfish Advisory Board. Uh, this should be the most important article to all of us. Yes, it may be flawed. Is fertilizer the biggest problem? No, it's certainly not a silver bullet. There's a lot of problems. But uh, I, it, there's something I'd just like to bring to people's attention. First of all, uh, a le little less than 30% of the eelgrass that was in the harbor when eelgrass mapping began about 20 to 25 years ago is all that's left. Uh, if, if we lose our base gallop industry, it's not coming back. I personally, I'll choose the harbor over playing golf. I'm sorry. Maybe somebody can come up with an amendment for to put a five-year uh, window on this a sunset date. But uh, it, you know, it, and it would also be nice if people would do their own, take their own responsibility. Maybe they don't realize there are storm drains outside this building that lead to the harbor. There are over 24 outfall pipes that lead to our harbor. Pleasant Street, Pine Street, Fair Street, Union Street, Academy Hill, the center of town, the Woodbury Lane development. Uh, it, it, the list goes on how much water from all of our yards and rooftops end up directly into the harbor untreated. We need an infrastructure upgrade to say the least. And until improvements and, and, and regulations are in place for homeowners to recharge their own stormwater on their own property, uh, then, then we need to support this article until better precautions are in place. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go up to this woman who's been waiting to be heard. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is Samantha Dinette. I'm the director of the Nantucket Shellfish Association. I'm here today to speak both as a citizen and on behalf of our board and our over 700 members who all care deeply about the harbor and our water quality. It is the opinion of the Nantucket Shellfish Association that the time is now for our community to further restrict the use of fertilizer on island. Regulations have been in place since 2012, and here we are a decade later. They have proven to be both insufficient and inefficient. There has been negligence in the enforcement of these regulations, and the quality of our harbor has suffered significantly. At times, it is said that regulations are unenforceable or that there is a lack of manpower. It's our opinion that the reality is that there is a lack of prioritizing these regulations in regards to water quality. In addition to enforcement, much more could be done to educate both the landscapers and the homeowners, yet the town passes up these opportunities. That is why we feel that Article 79 to further restrict the use of fertilizer is of paramount importance. From the perspective of the Nantucket Shellfish Association, the harbor and fishery is in jeopardy. Their habitat is being ruined by over-fertilization and nutrient loading, and if we don't make significant changes now, it will soon be too late. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna go over here and recognize this man. My apologies, Madam Moderator. I would now like to call the question, if that's possible. Can I make a correction? Oh, you my name just, is Jasper Young. Okay, uh, you did it, and I'm taking your motion. You have a just a correction you wanna make? I have a correction in, in response to Mr. Lowell. 
Okay, go um, ahead. Just make your correction, then we'll do the mo we'll None do the of the golf courses have anything to do with the harbor. We're not in the harbor watershed. So that's all I wanted to put on the record. Okay, thank you. All right, so the gentleman moved the question. I didn't get his name, I'm sorry to say. That will um, end debate, as you know. It requires a two-thirds vote. A yes vote will adopt the motion to move the question. A no vote will defeat that motion. We are ready to vote. Voting is now open. One for yes, two for no. No. Voting is now closed. On the motion to move the question, 379 yes, 94 no, that motion is adopted. Okay, so that means that we have to go immediately to a vote on Mr. DaCosta's proposed amendment. His proposed amendment is a complete substitute for the main motion by the Finance Committee. Is there a question? The Dutra amendment? We, I thought we did that as a friendly amendment. No? I thought we did that as a friendly amendment. But if you want to vote on the Dutra amendment separately, I certainly can do that. Okay. All right. Well, let's go right to a vote. We'll go right to a vote on the Dutra amendment. Then once we've disposed of that, we can go right to a vote on Mr. DaCosta's amendment as affected by or not affected by the Dutra amendment. I hope everyone is following along at home. So... All right, so now we're going to vote just on Mr. Dutra's amendment, which is to introduce the language in green that says, except that fertilizer shall be allowed during the first year of plant establishment after proper soil testing. That requires a majority vote. A yes vote will adopt that amendment. A no vote will defeat the amendment. We are ready to vote. Voting is now open. It requires a majority vote. One for yes, two for no. Voting is now closed on Mr. Dutra's amendment. Yes, 194, no, 274. That amendment is not adopted. Okay, so now we are on Mr. DaCosta's amendment, which is a substitute main motion, a yes vote, will adopt Mr. DaCosta's amendment. A no vote will defeat that amendment. Now, I just have to explain, we're gonna to have to vote on this twice. So the first time we're voting on it as an amendment, and then the second time, if it's adopted, we'll be voting on it 
as the substitute main motion, or we will be back voting on the main motion made by the Finance Committee. So, on Mr. DaCosta's amendment, a yes vote will adopt the amendment, a no vote will defeat the amendment. Voting is open, one for yes, two for no. So in case there's any confusion, it's very important if you care about this article, stay until we, well, you should stay till the end of the meeting, of course, because it's fabulous. But <laughs> if you feel the need to leave, don't leave until we've started Article 80. Okay, voting is now closed. On Mr. DaCosta's motion, yes, 337, no, 132, that motion is adopted. Okay, so now we're going to vote on Article 79 as proposed by the Finance Committee and amended now by Mr. DaCosta with his substitute motion. So a yes vote will approve, adopt that um, motion, a no vote will defeat it. It requires a majority vote. We are ready to vote. One for yes, two for no. Voting is now closed. On Mr. DaCosta's motion, 374, yes. 105, no. That motion is adopted. Okay. Article 80. Article 80 starts on page 149, continues to page 150. The motion from the Finance Committee was moved not to adopt the article. The article was called by, I think, Mr. Pacino. And I believe that Mr. Booms has a motion. Are you here, Mr. Booms, somewhere? Yes, sir. Yes, Madam Moderator. Oh, OK. So here you are. So your motion on Article um, 80 is soon to be revealed. Madam Moderator, I want to be given a moment to speak. Excuse me? I was hoping to have a moment to speak. Yes, you are. But okay. aren't, I got to get your motion up there first. I'm not doing a motion at the moment. You're not? No. Who's doing the motion? Potentially Andy, but. Uh... But, okay, but we have to make a motion first. So are you gonna make a motion and then give your time to him? Okay, so let's get your motion up there first. If you could come over to just to the microphone so we can all hear you say so moved. Well, do you have their motion? Okay. So your motion, as I, as I remember it, is you want to refer this to somewhere, a committee? What, do, what is it, you, what, what, would your, what is your motion? Um, I wasn't making a motion. I was simply um, making sure we could talk about this article. So okay. That... 
All right, so I thought, and maybe I'm probably delusional because this has been a long day and lots of amendments. I thought rather than making a motion to pass, try to pass this home rule petition, mm -hmm. that you were making a motion to refer this subject matter of this article to the HDC or some other committee for further study. No. Is that not correct? That's not correct. Okay, so you want to make a motion to adopt the article. That's correct. Okay. Then, here we go. So your motion is as follows. Move that the town's representatives to the general court are hereby requested to introduce legislation, et cetera. And then it follows completely the language printed on pages 149 and 150 of the warrant. Is that, is that your motion? Yes, that's true. That's okay. correct. So that's been moved, and is there a second? Motion is made and seconded. Now, if you want to speak, you can speak, or you can defer to Mr. Booms, either way. I'll defer to Mr. Booms. Okay, perfect, Mr. Thank Booms. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, my name is Jeff Booms. Um, thank you for all your attendance and dedication to Ryland. First, I want to say how I appreciate the HTC and the valuable time that the HTC board puts in for our benefit. I love coming home to Nantucket and appreciate how the houses blend into town and country. That said, I'm a degreed mechanical engineer with many years of engineering experience prior to making Nantucket home. My engineering background has made me look at the big picture with reality and numbers. If we do not install alternative energy and become a role model for alternative energy, we as an island will be underwater. The very history we are trying to preserve will be washed away. We see it in the paper regularly. We see predictions in uh, Kotu being washed away in 20 to 30 years. Substantial historic buildings flooding in the next 15 to 20 years. I don't know how many people realize the U.S. uses, what, 7.2 billion barrels of oil a year. And in the United States, we have 35 billion barrels of oil in reserve. If the rest of the world was to stop selling us oil, we'd have five years of oil. Think about that. Currently, solar panels are the only current usable, viable source of alternative energy we can produce. There is no oil below Nantucket. We can't drill for it. We can only buy it from somebody else. There's no other viable source right now. The, um, putting solar on your home is a no-brainer financially. Massachusetts provides solar loan programs. You can have solar put on your home for no money out of pocket. Systems can be paid for in about seven years. I have solar on my home for the last five. In the summertime, my meter goes backwards. You can produce your own energy, not buy oil from Russia and the Middle East. If you look at this room here, and you make a dividing line down the middle of the room, half the people here can have solar, and the other half can't have solar. If you are outside the historic district and uh, go to HDC, the majority of people will be denied having solar panels put on the roof. And you'll hear different, if you talk to the solar installers, there's already, it's a filtering mechanism. There's nothing in the HTC bylaws that say the HTC can't approve solar panels outside the historic district. But there's this underlying, if there are solar panels and if it's facing a public way they get denied and we hear repeatedly oh people are working with it um, but that's the fact if you talk to solar installers um, as i said i love the hdc there's maybe some older board members that um, i'm looking comments made about myself i'm a simple carpenter I do caretaking 
think in the paper it was stated that uh, I'm looking at it for development rights or developing. I've never developed anything on Nantucket from property. Um, one of my caretaking clients, if I'm trying to make money off of it, the only project we've done in the last two years, I waived my caretaking fees for their solar project. So I'm not here to make money. I want my daughter to be able to come back to Nantucket and have a Nantucket that's not underwater and we can be producing our own energy on the island. As of tomorrow, the HTC can start approving more solar panels and south-facing house. On my street, for example, luckily my roof faces south and it's in the backyard. Every one of my neighbors across the street, they're not gonna get approved unless potentially they go two or three times for um, review in front of the board of selectmen. There's been some turnovers. And people will say, well, you know, they're approving all these things. The reality is there's the filter. So you look at it, what are we going to make to make a difference? How can we produce energy? Solar panels are a way to produce energy. I want an island for myself. I want an island for all of you. And this is a way um, that we can make a difference with our environment. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Madam Moderator. Toby Brown. I'd like to move the question, please. Oh, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> OK. Well, I mean, fair and square, Mr. Brown. Um, why not? So we just it's, add a couple of boards. I know. It's up to the voters. If you want to allow these people who are standing at the microphones to speak, the HTC, for example, the staff person, then, really? then don't vote for this motion to move the question. If you're ready to move on, then you already know how you're going to vote. Move the question. I'm, I'm leaving it to you, and I'm trusting in your good judgment. So this requires a two-thirds vote. A yes vote will adopt the motion to move the question. A no vote will defeat the motion to move the question. Voting is now open. Yes for one, two for no. Two-thirds, I met. Voting is now closed on the motion to move the question on Article 80. Yes, 228. No, 204. That motion is not adopted. And I will go to Ms. Backus. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Holly Backus, Preservation Planner for the Town of Nantucket, staff liaison to both the Historical Commission and the HDC. Uh, both commissions know that I'm an advocate for education, especially preservation education in Nantucket history. With that said, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to provide some important dates in regards to our historic district. First, in 1955 was the year that the Special Act was enacted to create our two local districts, downtown Nantucket and Sconset. This was one of the first historic districts in the country after Charleston, South Carolina in 1933. 1955 was also the year Nantucket enacted the subdivision control law. 1966 was the year the National Historic Preservation Act was enacted, creating the federal historic preservation laws. 1966 was also the same year that Nantucket Historic District was nominated and became one of the country's first historic National Historic Landmark Districts and registered with the National Register of Historic Places. 1970 to 71, the year the island saw the construction of contemporary architecture at Tristram's Landing up in Atticut. Our forefathers through the Act of Town meeting then amended the special act to include the entire island as well as Tuckernot and Muskegon. It gave the HDC jurisdiction over the all construction 
on the island prior to zoning bylaw and building codes in 1972. 1975, the NHL nomination was adopted or updated to include Tuckernut and Muskegon. In 2001, through the active town meeting, Nantucket adopted CPC. Um, and in 2007, the Nantucket Preservation Trust received CPC funds to update our NHL nomination to include Nantucket's development in the 19th and 20th centuries and include our period of significance in the preservation movement. Um, the National Park Service at, and then approved this nomination up to 2000, uh, in, in the year of 2012. In 2009, Sustainable Nantucket sponsored the Clean Air Cool Planet to assist the HDC and fellow uh, to create design guidelines as an addendum to the building with Nantucket in mind. These practices are used today. It was also used as a case study. Sorry. <laughs> um, and this is a guide for historic districts throughout the nation. I just, lastly, I just wanted to mention that for statistics, in the year uh, 2019, the HDC approved 55 solar installations. And in fiscal year 2020, the HDC approved 81 solar installations. These are solar throughout the entire island, both within the local district and outside the local district. Thank you. Lastly, it's important just to understand the special act is different from our regular regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Paul. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, I am Ray Paul, the chairman of the Historic District Commission, and uh, I don't ordinarily speak for my entire board, our eight members, uh, but in this case I can safely. Uh, we are vehemently against this. Um, the Enabling Act, as Holly accurately pointed out, has been in, in place for decades. And uh, to change our Enabling Act to uh, cater to the uh, uh, whims of a special interest group of any kind, uh, we support solar, uh, but to uh, cater to the whims of any special interest group, I think is counter to the goals of certainly the Historic District Commission and to the island as a whole. Um, we review, scrupulously review, and approve many, many solar installations weekly. Uh, so the fact, or uh, the, the allegation that we do not is, is, is uh, untrue. Um, we also have uh, established a set of guidelines. Years ago, they were put in place. We are amending those guidelines to sort of keep pace with uh, the changing needs of the town and the advances that are being made in solar technology. I would urge you strongly, strongly to uh, vote against this. I'd also like to know whether I'm considered one of the older or the younger members of the Historic <laughs> District Commission. Think, Thank you very much. I think you're right in the middle. <laughs> yes, the man here in the... Uh, good evening, Madam Moderator. Uh, J.P. Hernandez. Um, I would like to offer the perspective of somebody who's in the middle now of trying to get a Tesla solar shingle roof installed, and we're in the middle of the HDC process. I think it might give folks here some sense for whether the interests in uh, the environment and all the benefits that uh, I think were well spoken for uh, earlier are being appropriately balanced uh, with respect to uh, our other quite valid interests in, in maintaining the, the look and the feel and the beauty of, of Nantucket. Um, so the Tesla solar, I, I had one round, I, I've already been through the HDC once and got my butt kicked pretty good. I'd, I'd give my own performance probably about a C minus, I'd say myself and the representative from Tesla who was supposed to speak, we didn't do a great job, so that's on us. Um, but I have to say I was quite surprised by the um, level of detail, um, the the standard that we were being asked to hit, um, especially, again, in, in light of the um, countervailing interests, the, the important interests, in, in you know, which I don't think I need to explain to anybody here in terms of the environmental benefits. So here are examples of questions that came back to me. Uh, what is Tesla? Apparently, we were supposed to come back and explain what this company is. I think, you know, I don't know how I, people have written books about this. Elon Musk is buying Twitter at the moment. How, am I, how exactly am I supposed to do this? I'm not sure. 
um, we were asked to send additional solar shingle uh, samples to the HDC. This required a special approval from Tesla, which I almost did not get uh, because of the resources and all the rest. The, this product, not that I have time to go into it, but it actually, the, the roof is, is, the, is the solar. The shingles themselves produce the solar. So it's designed to look and feel exactly like a traditional asphalt roof. And I realize I'm out of time, but the, the, the sort of questions we got back were really with respect to how we would prove to HDC that in fact that's the case. And um, the thing that struck me, um, that really caught me off guard in that, in that you know, vetting was that we got what seemed like an incredibly insular uh, response from HDC. The, these shingles have a track record. They've been approved by other um, historic commissions. This is a splashy product. I'm sure many people in this room know what Tesla is. You can read all kinds of reviews. Everybody can, we can just know these things by going to Google and knowing that in fact it's a product that doesn't shine any more or less than a traditional asphalt roof. If you could wrap up. I, 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 I will bring it to, I'll bring it down the home stretch here. And so I just want to suggest that to, to those in the room that are listening, maybe that's how you want it to work. I don't know. I know for myself, I would err much more on the side of trying to give a, a, a wider berth for these important environmental concerns, um, even if it means that we have to go a little, you know, quicker on the HDC approval. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Golding? Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, and thank you, Holly, for that sort of um, uh, quick historical perspective. And Ray, um, certainly the work that you do uh, is much appreciated, but I have to um, I have to disagree uh, about your analysis uh, or your your lack of support for this article. I'm certainly um, I'm not in the solar construction business. I look at um, climate change as being an existential threat both to the island and the country and the globe. And I think we should do everything we can at every level for alternative energy. And um, so I, f I feel that uh, allowing solar panels outside of the historic districts of the town in Sconset is a, is a fairly um, modest ask. And um, the reference to Tristram Landing in 1971 uh, we all know how much build-out has taken place since 1971 in the last 50 years. So um, to, to say, so that the, um, the umbrella definition of the island being historic as a whole, I think, um, makes me smile a little bit. I don't know how many people in this audience remember Whalebone Hill which is now submerged under McMansions, but back in the day was a great spot to watch uh, fireworks from across the harbor. So I hope this is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good evening, Stephen Welch. Um, I would just like to comment quickly on the Tesla. The HCC is well aware of what the product is, what the potential problems are, um, they were reviewing to establish uh, whether or not a test case could be utilized. Um, we are, as a group, uh, hopeful that the Tesla will become a great solution for the island. Um, by the way, I am an HTC associate currently, and, um, but I am speaking uh, on my own behalf, uh, and i quickly get into it because I realize I don't have much time. Um, I'd like to suggest energy resil resiliency is or should be an important part of Nantucket's new history. Done well, it will echo and integrate with our island's storied past. Um, there is uh, this, this, however, this article does not accomplish the goal. Uh, as well intended as it is, there are some unintended consequences, or at least what I perceive as unintended consequences. First, various locations thought of as being within the OHDs and ostensibly protected from solar panels actually are not. On these streets, there are historic jewels, some large and stately, some small and charming, many of, you, many of which are historically contributing structures. In Sconset, these homes include along a portion of Main Street, Bunker Hill, Lincoln, Lindbergh, Sankety, and Baxter Road. And in town, most of the Brant Point area, including all homes on Halbert Ave, 
Willard, Walsh, Swain, and East Lincoln. And further out, all homes on Lincoln Ave and Lincoln Circle. Moore's End and Highland Ave are also included. I can't say how likely, likely it is these homes will become adorned with solar panels or booms as allowed by the article or when. However, with the passage of this particular article written as it is, these installations will be allowed and the HTC's hands will be tied or at least bound with costly, highly distracting litigation. I'll skip over the other unintended consequences, um, all of which are material to suggest that this article on the merits uh, deserves a work group be formed by the HTC to include a representational cross-section of appropriate parties tasked to formulate recommendations to, to the HTC to update the HTC's sustainable preservation guidelines. This work to be initiated by the HTC within 120 days after this annual town meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I think we are ready to vote. Oh, I didn't yes. see you there. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anton Rogozin, and I would just like to add a few words. Okay. Um, I live uh, on a tucked away street, and my house is positioned the way that it would, would only make sense to place the solar panels on this street face inside of the house. But I was told that um, I would never be allowed to do that because somebody 50 years ago thought they were unsightly. And they were probably right. At that time, they were unsightly, but a lot has changed since that time. Now we are facing a lot of problems, and uh, uh, the transition to the sustainable energy is, is our, should be our main concern. Um, we should be welcoming solar panels, but instead, we are getting kicked in the teeth. Um, so please, uh, please support this article. Let's bring solar panels. Let's, let's accelerate the transition to the sustainable energy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hallahan? I'm speaking, I'm speaking against this. I, the people who are in HDC are our friends and our neighbors. We need to give them as much flexibility as possible. All these questions can't be answered by one written warrant. People who are on the HDC have the background, have the interest of, uh, of Nantucket, and I think we need to give them as much flexibility as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, up in the back. Madam moderator, thank you. Uh, my name is Andy Pacino. I'm an energy consultant, and I've partaken in about 20 buildings that have been Net zero, and net zero is design, uh, defined as generating more energy than you consume. This Article 80 uh, speaks directly to that. As a, in the middle of our huge building boom right now, um, we still have a housing crisis. And this gentleman that just spoke um, deserve solar as much as anyone. And so that's the pre-filter that Mr. Boom spoke about earlier. He didn't even apply to HDC because it was already understood that those criteria that the HDC upholds uh, wouldn't approve his solar roof. Uh, and so that's the concern. It's important uh, in the coming 10 years, uh, as we adopt more electrification of our homes, for heating and cooling, hot water, your Tesla car, not just your Tesla rooftop. All those, all those things are consuming more electricity. And we don't want, so it's a pipeline problem. It's a supply problem. We're gonna be using more electricity here starting now, starting the past three years. Homes are being electrified on a daily basis. And so we're consuming more. If we, if we don't start to adopt solar aggressively, then we're going to need a third cable. And no one in this room wants that. And so that's what this speaks to. We need to aggressively change the way that solar is adopted across the island. I have three seconds. Article 80. Please vote yes. Thank you. Yes. Hi, how you doing? Uh, my name is Raymond DaCosta. Um, I'm not really sure where I stand on this, but I just wanted to give some context for those who are 
seeming like they're very for solar panels. Um, the HDC only allows you to have single pane windows. You dump more heat out of that than you could imagine. If you want to uh, change something and make it more green, maybe start there, because you really can't tell the difference between a single pane and a double pane window. At least not most people. Um, secondly, your Tesla car here, it does help out, but it helps out a lot more in the mainland where you drive a lot. If you really want to help out, ride a bike. And also, also, the harbor in Nantucket, going back to an article, is completely eliminated of eelgrass for the most part. Eelgrass is one of the largest carbon eaters we have. It is the best carbon eater on this island. If you really would like to help out and take some carbon out of your environment, go talk to Samantha, see how you can help out. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dutra? Uh, yes, uh, just, just quickly. Um, uh, a couple points. Um, uh, uh, the, um, I, I've, I was aware of the uh, Tesla. I'm on the HTC board as an alternate, and I was watching the Tesla um, uh, um, interview, for lack of a better word. And the thing that needs to be understood there is this is a first time that this has been seen, and the board really needs to look at that with scrutiny. Um, they are all for and excited uh, to see uh, the Tesla uh, roof hopefully be able to work better than the, the, the what's being built or uh, installed now. And I just, you know, I, I'm a total environmentalist. I'm so pro-solar. I agree with everyone's point on solar, and I think that we need more of it on the island or we're going to sink. Um, and I think that the, the board... Um, is not the board's not against solar. The board it, it, it approves solar every week. There are very few applications that get denied. So I invite people to bring in their applications, and and, and not just because of what they've heard, to see um, if they can get approved. Because they're they're not. And what I am fearful for is is the little pocket of our downtown historic downtown. Um, if something like this article passes and we as a board don't have any control over it, you, you're going to be seeing a lot more complaints with people saying that there's solar all over the roofs and, and blaring in your face. And I don't think that's what we want to see either. So um, just take these into considerations before you vote. Thank you. Ms. Williams? I was uh, on the HDC for almost 20 years and was the chairman. And when I was involved with the adoption of the original solar guidelines uh, with Dirk Raghavine back in the day, and I have spoken to Lauren Sinatra, who is our energy person, and they do need to be updated. We all know they need to be updated. The technology has changed, um, terminology has changed, and that I believe um, some of the uh, HTC board members who are beginning to undertake, they have not been adopted any changes yet. I think what you need to understand is that this is a home rule petition that's going to tinker with our special act. Now the rest of the state is under a different HDC legislation except for three areas. I believe it's us, the Vineyard, and maybe the King's Highway on the Cape. Um, there is a whole section that was adopted by the rest of the state relative to solar energy and alternative energy sources. When we do the rewrite of our act, and there's a lot of things wrong with the act, there's syntax, there's terminology, there's all kinds of things that need to be updated, which we started years ago, I have a copy of it. We can incorporate appropriately a whole section on solar energy and alternative energy. Sending a home rule petition up to tinker with it with unintended consequences is a bad idea, and that's why the HDC, all eight members, were opposed to doing it this way one at a time, because the whole, the whole act needs to be rewritten, not piecemeal. And as we know in the past, the state takes a very dim view on these home rule petitions. It may take two years to even get heard, et cetera, et cetera. So I ask you to vote against this and give the HCC time and the select board time maybe to uh, constitute, as Stephen said, a committee that would uh, look at all alternative energies and its impact on the visual uh, aspect, which is what the HDC has jurisdiction over from a publicly traveled way, and create a uh, commission with HDC members, members of the public, members from the solar and any other alternative energy that's on Nantucket. But I think that's the best idea that I've heard yet. But that can happen without this going up to the state. 
So the select board and the HDC can uh, draft something Thank that you. might work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Welch? Uh, just briefly, <clears throat> excuse me if I may, I just want to clarify a couple things. One, um, I spoke with Andy, uh, Tim Carruthers of Act Solar, uh, Karen Alance of Cotuit Solar earlier today, the concept of the work group. Um, uh, on the committee, on the commission, I am a, a consistent advocate for the integration of solar, uh, and is, I think they would attest to in any public forum. Um, and then lastly, and I think most importantly, the concept of the work group is not to, um, one, send this into a dusty shelf somewhere. The idea is to bring people who have various talents and knowledge and expertise into a um, kind of an intense work group to come up with a product that includes, for instance, solutions that allow solar to be integrated uh, on homes outside the OHD to better clarify what areas um, can be more liberal, what areas, for instance, the uh, areas I outlined earlier that are buffers along the OHD and many have contributing uh, historic structures, kind of hammer those out and um, come up with a vote, uh, uh, a recommendation for the HCC to vote, um, perhaps even with a deadline so that if for some reason it doesn't come to fruition, uh, this article could come back. Um, and in the spirit of that, I'd be remiss if I didn't make the motion. So I will, um, if you bear with me, and I apologize if it's a waste of time, but the motion is that a work group be formed by the HDC, or amendment, I'm sorry, a work, a work group be formed by the HDC to include a representational cross-section of appropriate parties tasked to formulate recommendations to the HDC to update the HDC Sustainable Pre Preservation Guidelines, that is, s Sustainable Preservation, an addendum to building with Nantucket and Mine, this work group to be initiated by the HDC within 120 days after this annual town meeting. Thank you. So, okay. So do you want to make a motion then to refer it to the HDC for the purpose of that forming that committee? That sounds like a great idea. Okay, can you, um, can you email me that language? Yeah, if, you, if and, you just shout out your phone number, I'll text it to you. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a great idea. So I need you to read it then, really slowly. So let's say, let's say mm -hmm. this is gonna be your yeah. motion, and let me see if Mary, we're just like a blank slate here. Yeah, Move, sir, I'm well, sorry, do you want me to email it? I can do it right I do, now. but I also want to read it really slowly. Here. Moved that the subject matter of Article 80 be referred to the HDC for the purpose of forming a committee. Oh, I'm just talking and it's not, ha nothing's happening. All right, hold on. Ready? Okay. I kind of like this. Are you going to want this back? <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Moved that the subject matter of Article 80 be referred to the HDC for the purpose of forming a work group to include a representational cross-section, oh, work group. For the, oh, for the purpose of forming a work group, all right. To include a representational, representational cross-section of appropriate parties as determined by the HDC tasked tasked T-A-S-K-E-D tasked tasked 
I think I might have a speech impediment, <laughs> tasked to formulate recommendations to update the HDC's sustainable preservation guidelines parentheses quote sustainable preservation hyphen an addendum to building with Nantucket in mind end quote end parentheses preservation it's sustainable preservation it's with a capital S and a capital P I should have said that Okay, preservation, hyphen, an addendum to building with Nantucket in mind. That's capital B, capital N, capital M, with Nantucket in mind, end quote, end parentheses. such work group to be formed by the HDC within 120 days of this annual town meeting. Okay. All right, so back up where it says, Mary, where it says recommendations to update the HDC, it should be HDC's. Yep, there you go. Ap apostrophe S. All right, does that do it? Okay. Okay, is that your motion, Mr. Welch? You better yes. say yes. Madam moderator. <laughs> okay, is there a second? Okay, so on Mr. Welch's motion, this is debatable. I don't know if anyone wants to say anything. It does require a majority vote. It looks like we're ready to vote. Ah, yes. I wonder if Mr. Welch would consider a, a modification. Appropriate party, I'm sorry, Peter Hoey, live in uh, Titocamo with my wife, Linda. I wonder if, uh, Mr. Welch would consider uh, a modification, namely appropriate parties is kind of vague. And I, I, I didn't, maybe it should say to include, I don't know, more detail to that. And also I would ask the question, should the HTC alone be making up this committee? Those are my two questions. They're, okay, so I, I think the HTC will constitute the committee, but you're going to have other, you're going to have a, this representational cross-section? If, if I may clarify, perhaps sure. as opposed to amending the intent so it's established. Um, the idea is it is uh, established by the, would constitute the work group um, of individuals from within the community. Appropriate parties are such people as architects, designers, solar company installers, members from the Nantucket Historical Commission, members from the Nantucket Historic District Commission, our own HDC, and others of similar experience. Um, perhaps a, a representative from the Nantucket Energy, um, the town's energy department, and so on and so forth. The idea is that this not be appropriate as to use uh, wiggle uh, language, or uh, as an attorney sometimes say, weasel language, it is to be appropriate, as in, as in fully appropriate, to be including in a comprehensive representational, representational cross-section so that we can move these things forward in a, in a way that is um, 
going to help the HCC's mission and the community. Thank you. Thank you. Are you satisfied with that, Mr. Hoey, or do you want to make an amendment to Mr. Welch's motion? I'll leave it the way it is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're on record, though, Mr. Welch, so we'll be, we'll be following up with you. Madam moderator. Okay. It's Yes, Ms. Backus. Thank you. I just wanted to make a point of clarification that the previous work group that was formed that created the existing sustainable preservation design guidelines were actually ma members made up the HDC preservation specialist, energy specialist working together, which is exactly what Mr. Welch had mentioned. So that would be what we would do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So on Mr. Welch's motion to refer this to the HDC for the purpose of forming this work group requires a majority vote. I think you're ready to vote. A yes vote will adopt this motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. It requires a majority vote. Voting is now open. One for yes, two for no. Okay, voting is now closed. Yes, 328. No, 81. That motion is adopted. Okay, so we have four articles left. We're going now to Article 81. Article 81 is on page 151 of the warrant continues all the way to page 154. It received a not to adopt motion from the Finance Committee, but I have a positive motion from the article sponsor, Ms. Rayport. And as soon as I have that up, Good evening, everyone. Okay. Oh, is it time to speak? I'm sorry, just, I'm a little t tired. I know. Just hang, hang on for just one more second. So, Ms. Rayport is going to make the motion that's printed on the screen. It's essentially what's in the warrant with some textual changes. We'll just go through it a little bit. So, scroll down, Mary, if you could, to where we get to changes. Okay. Wait, whoop. So we're adding, um, and I think this is in actually the text of, yes, environmental and cultural, changing the definition to the planning commission or the commission, expanding as it is um, printed in the warrant, the purpose of the planning commission, changing the membership to 11 members, three representatives of the planning board appointed annually by the planning board, one representative of the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust in place of the Housing Authority to be appointed annually by the trust, one representative of the county commissioners to be appointed annually by the county commissioners, one representative of the Conservation Commission, one member of the Nantucket Historical Commission to be appointed annually by said commission, the director of the Nantucket um, Department of Public Works or his or her designee designated by the town manager and three persons um, to be elected. Then this next section adds in how they're elected um, and staggers the terms so that everyone is serving a three-year term ultimately. 
vacancies are filled by a majority vote of the Planning Commission for the balance of the unexpired term. And then the election. And then in terms of their responsibilities, we're adding protection of the physical and social, environment, economy, and general quality of life of the town and county of Nantucket, as well as making recommendations for action. And then we have cultural resources added in. The, a new requirement, the 2A, that the Planning Commission shall produce and make available a written report of its activities annually. Um, some small language changes in three, followed by the Planning Commission may be designated by any state or federal agency to participate in or receive funds and technical assistance from any state or federal programs, especially as those programs relate to environmental protection, conservation, land planning, water and air quality control, economic development, transportation, or the development of region-wide public services. Within 30 days following each annual town election, the Planning Commission shall elect a chairman and vice chairman and make such other rules and regulations not inconsistent with the act. Sets forth some duties of the chair to preside over the meetings, um, propose agenda items and report annually to the people of the town. And the Planning Commission shall be one of the Commonwealth's regional planning agencies. And then mostly just capitalization issues and their votes are a simple majority, which is a statement of the existing. And this act shall take passage upon its effect. Uh, shall take effect upon its passage. So is that your is that your motion, Ms. Rayport? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Yeah, motion is made and seconded. Ms. Rayport. Thank you. Well, if everybody wants to stretch a little bit, you may. I know we've all been here a long time, and if you hadn't read the article, Sarah just read everything again. So thank you, Madam Moderator, for going through it, um, and thank you all for staying and um, hearing this article. Um, it makes some changes and some improvements to the Planning Commission, which is also known as the NPNEDC. Um, so mainly, I. I'm bringing this, I, I bring this with a lot of respect for everyone who serves in town government and everyone who keeps things running in this complex town. Um, Nantucket has become so busy. Everyone needs something. Everyone has a project and a deadline and people are under a lot of pressure. But we still need to plan for the future and maybe some different approaches, some different voices would help the planning department. And that is really the purpose of this, is to bring some different voices into the mix to help. It's hard to get to the long-term work when it's everything you can do to get to the work that's due tomorrow. This article is now in the hands of town meeting. It proposes, as you've seen, a different mix of voices on the Planning Commission and a few directly elected members. It's good for the long-term health of Nantucket. And I hope that you vote yes on Article 81. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to be heard? Mr. Um, Cohen? Uh, yeah, Madam Moderator, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Raypour for this um, Unlimited Employment for Lawyers Act. Um, <laughs> but I'd like to encourage town meeting to vote against it. It is a massive overstep into the CONCOM and HGC and planning boards uh, and select boards regula uh, regulatory authority with no apparent purpose. The last thing we need on Nantucket is more regulatory authority of, of boards without clear purposes. The last thing we need is more staff time without, and more, more uh, expenses without clear purposes. Uh, I appreciate the effort, but uh, I think this is really uh, a 
new massive regulatory agency with, with no purpose uh, that has not shown any need. And I would encourage the town meeting to defeat it. And if there's an intent to uh, do something, that that should be done in a more um, thoughtful process where there's a, uh, a purpose, not just a new regulatory agency. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Joanna Roach, um, I would like to make uh, a motion to move this to the NPEDC for further study. Okay, so you're making a motion to refer this, the matter of this, yes. back to the um, NP and EDC for further study. Yes. Okay, that motion's been made and seconded. That is debatable. If you want to say why you're suggesting that? Uh, I think that the additions that were made tonight were not something that were something any of us discussed. And I think it, you know, I think that the article, you know, I, obviously Ms. Rayport did work on this, but I think that it requires um, some conversation with the NEPDC and that they deserve to weigh in on it. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone who hasn't been heard before I go back to Ms. Rayport? Um, I'll go to this gentleman, I'll go to you, Ms. Dye, and then Ms. Rayport, I'll come back up to you. Hi, I'm uh, Sam Baker, and... I'm sorry, I can't hear Sam you. Sam Baker. Sam okay. Baker? Okay, great. Um, yeah, great. so let me just speak uh, before we, uh, in opposition to the, the new motion, uh, and just do this by breaking down uh, what uh, Hillary is, is actually proposing, because I don't think it's, uh, it's what she's basically proposing is just to update, uh, you know, an act that hasn't been updated since 1973. And uh, so maybe let's just break it down a little bit so it doesn't look uh, to be that, uh, that threatening. Basically, what she's she's calling for is that the the planning commission uh, to be appointed uh, from not only the planning board, ComCon, and the select board, but also from the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust, the Nantucket Historical Commission, as well as uh, DPW. So, what she's trying to do is she's trying to bring in more balance, more perspective uh, to uh, modern issues that we face here on Nantucket. Uh, because we do face uh, a number of issues that we've talked about in the last two days, affordable housing, historical preservation, conservation, and economic uh, sustainability. So what this is asking to do is to, to balance uh, the approach uh, so that there's a more diverse uh, group uh, of um, perspectives. And uh, because long-term planning is difficult, uh, and the other thing it's proposing is three at-large representatives, uh, representatives that are voted by the voters or voted in by the people, uh, and that uh, because this is one commission now that only uh, that that appoints their own members, and that's the only I understand that's the only commission that that's the case. Uh, the other thing it, it does is it has accountability uh, in terms of an annual report. So there's really three very uh, you know good reasons. One for the Planning Commission to provide a balanced perspective to an annual progress report, and three, a structural and procedural process uh, where you have perspectives from all, uh, all the major issues. So that's, that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tai? Yes, thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I'm currently the chair of the Housing Authority, and we were never consulted about the elimination of our seat here um, until after the article was written. To me, that's just an example of why this needs more input and more work. I would like to ask through you, Madam Moderator, to the Finance Committee why specifically they made a negative recommendation on this, if I may. Yes. Ms. Corno? Sure. Thank you. Um, I'd ask you all to imagine for a moment that you are involved in something. You do work on it, you spend time on it, it's something you enjoy doing, and you're pretty good at it, and, and, and you get good outcomes. Now, someone comes in from the outside and says, okay, that's great, but now we're gonna redo it, and I'm going to put all this stuff in place and redo it for you. But I didn't ask you your opinion. I didn't ask you how you would consider redoing it or how you would consider modernizing it. 
So that's the crux of the reason that the Finance Committee ended up saying, you didn't ask the MP and EDC, or who I lovingly call the Alphabet Commission. You didn't ask um, the Housing Authority. You didn't ask so many, uh, the Planning Board. In fact, you didn't ask the DPW, you didn't ask Town Manager. You didn't include any of the key stakeholders in this redesign. Now, all of us can do better, all committees can do better, all committees need improvement, but it's so much easier to steer the boat from inside the boat than from swimming alongside it and pushing it. And so we, we felt from the very beginning that this was something that had to be done as um, Joanna Roche just made the motion uh, in, a, in a study back with the MP and let the people who know the most about it study it, make the improvements that they wanna make, invite people who are engaged in this to have conversations about what could make it better and do it in a collaborative way versus poking at it from the outside. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Molden. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Emily Molden with the Nantucket Land Council. I can't speak to um, what was just discussed from the Finance Committee's perspective. I just kind of wanted to add another perspective to this. I don't really see this article establishing a new regulatory body. I think that Nantucket as a community has always really valued long-term planning and the NP and EDC has historically been and should consider continue to be a critical force behind that, that planning. I see this as opening the door for them to focus on a wider range of issues uh, and establishing a broader purpose. Um, so I just wanted to add that perspective to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fee? Yeah, I, I, I want to, I think sometimes, sometimes you're on it when you're on a committee, you, you know, you get, you get insular. You, you just think about it from your perspective and from the committee. I think there's some uh, points that Hillary has brought forth that are valid. And I think that they, whether it goes to a, goes to the committee to be looked at, that would be great. But I think, you know, I think the idea of appointing th of having three people elected is a good one. I don't think this is uh, a wholesale, wholesale change of the committee. I think it's it's a, it's a slight tweak. I think bringing in uh, the purpose of the planning commission and balanced growth into the planning commission is important. And I've been inside the belly of the beast, and sometimes it, it isn't. Uh, it's not that effective. We get stuck, and we don't do long-range planning, and we all show up. And, and so I think that you know. So so I think that there's valid uh, points here that need to be considered. Whether we support this tonight, which I would ask you to do, but if you don't, I hope that the uh, NPDC really digs into this and looks at it. We need to look further ahead and plan further ahead and make that. Uh, part of the culture here. Uh, I think the, I served on the NPDC multiple times now, and it, it's as over the years, it slowly turned into a traffic committee. We, and we would do, basically we were doing the tasks needed to get money from the state, but we weren't really delving into the, them. And people can say, well, Matt, that's your fault. Why didn't you push that? Well, you try to do it, but everyone's busy and everyone's exhausted, and you meet, you know, eight times a year. And so I think that really something has to change and we do have to shake this up in some way. And I thank Hillary for her intelligence and her bravery at, you know, at putting this forward with a lot of people who don't like her and think that she's doing the wrong thing. And I don't believe that she, I think she has Nantucket's best intent at heart. And I think, and I, you know, I really, it's difficult sometimes to uh, row against the tide. And so for that, I thank her. Thank you. Um, Ms. Benz? Um, I only met Hillary uh, two days ago. You so know, uh, this is starting to feel very personal. Okay. And right. I, I would like, I, I let Mr. Fee, I gave Mr. Fee some leeway, but I. Okay, uh, this, all Sorry. I wanted to do, all I wanted to do is point out what the article. Yeah, let's talk about the do. article okay. and let's not talk about the Essentially, sponsor. Essentially, the article um, changes the structure of the NP and EDC to bring in 
uh, a broader base of experience to help do the things that Matt was just mentioning, not getting stuck. Uh, brings in a representative from the Historical Commission, possibly one from the town. But what it really does is if you look at the 11 members, with all five members of the planning board, and the planning board appointing the three at-large members, who has the last word in those decisions? If this does not pass tonight, but it does go to a group of people to consider, I think the suggestion that the three at-large members that presently populate those seats on the commission become elected positions so that we can bring in a diverse, a more diverse group with larger experience who are not beholden to the Planning Commission for their selection. I think that really is one of the more important parts of this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wall? Uh, uh. <laughs> I knew this was coming. That's all right. We can handle it down here. Mr. Allahan's comment about the HDC members being friends. You've got to really speak into the microphone. Mr. Allahan's comments about Perfect. HDC members being our friends and neighbors, I was wondering how everyone felt about us. I guess I'm finding out. That's okay, though. We'll take it. So some years back, you might remember this, some of you older, middle and up, I guess is the new one. There was a first government study committee suggested we make the HDC appointed and we make the planning board appointed. Now, I know you might not all remember that, but I do. And it was pretty ugly, okay? So we have the Board of Health, which is new, that's appointed. We have the ZBA that's appointed. They make lots of decisions every day, every week, every month. We have the Finance Committee that's appointed. And we have the CONCOM. They're in the news a lot, making lots of decisions, none of which are elected by the people. When we hear that, there's always an undertone with that, okay? So there's a lot of things in Nantucket that don't fit other communities. We hear that all the time. We're different, we're different, we're different, we're different. We are different. We certainly proved that in the last two days here, didn't we? We are a community that likes to say no before it says yes. And we've been doing it for over 100 years. It's very difficult to plan long-term. We hear long-term planning. 2019, this place was booming, just like it always, we always say it's booming, but it's really about every seven or eight years. And we, nobody would have ever predicted what would have happened to the real estate market in, if there was a pandemic the next year. It's pretty hard to predict things. We never would have predicted 19, the mid-80s, 500 lots a year were created. 500 lots a year. Nobody talks about it. We had zoning that was allowed an awful lot. We've reduced an incredible amount of development. Can you wrap it up, please, Mr. Will? I know, it's too bad I didn't get the five minutes. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I appreciate the attention to this, but to make, to make Jack Gardner, Wendy Hudson, and Mary Longacre elected, what is that gonna change? Those are our three at-large members, okay? We have five elected members, planning board. We have elected member of the select board as the county commissioner. And we have the housing authority elected member. Okay, when you send, thank you. I'm gonna, just let me have one more thing, Sarah. If you I'll mind. let you add one more thing, but you're, lo you're losing your audience, so. Great, thanks a lot. So, <laughs> when you send something to the state, you better be sure it's right. 
We're seeing that with the steamship legislation, which is un, unthought out. Nobody knew a thing about it. Nobody mentioned it to anyone. It just happened. Okay? This is kind of similar. We wouldn't do that to the land bank. We're very testy about any changes to the land bank. Well, this is a state agency as well. Okay. I urge you to vote for the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Madam okay. Moderator, and, move yep. the question, please. Okay. And, excuse me. I asked to come back, and you said well, you'd come back to Ms. Rayport, and I, and I didn't take All right. I'll come back to you, Ms. Rayport, but make it, make it quick, and then we'll go to the Thank move you. the question. Um, Mr. Lowell, if you would bring an article forward, you get five minutes. I only took 40 seconds of my initial five minutes uh, out of respect for this room, but I have to say, um, first of all, I appreciate the support. I had a tremendous amount of support bringing this article to a uh, town meeting because people want more long range planning. We have a lot of work to do to make things better and a wonderful opportunity to do it. And we have a commission that has already established the planning commission. It's not at all a new commission. It already exists. We can make it better. And I want everyone to know that I took this article to the Nantucket Planning and Economic Development Commission um, in October. I asked them for feedback and amendments. I took it again to them in November. I took it again to them in December. Change is hard. People don't want to change. And this gives the ability for the people in this room to elect the people who want to do long range planning. We need more of it, it's hard. People are trying, the people on the planning board are trying, they're busy. Let's have an effective planning commission. And the best way to get feedback on my article, which I have taken again and again for feedback to people and asked for amendments from the housing folks and I have not gotten a response because change is hard and people are busy. So I am asking the people in this room to vote. Do we have to vote no on the amendment? It's, it's a motion to refer, it's not an amendment. Okay, I would ask for, to, for people to vote no on the motion to refer and yes to adopt Article 81 and it will take 15 months. This will come back to this meeting and you will have time, everybody will have time to do something else. But if you want something to happen, vote yes on 81 now for long range planning, environmental health, sustainability on Nantucket. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we're just gonna go to a vote on Ms. Roach's motion to refer the subject matter of Article 81 to the Planning Commission for further study. It does require a majority vote. We are ready to vote. Voting is now open. One for yes, two for no. If you vote yes, you're... I'm sorry, I didn't understand what we're voting for. Okay, stop the clock. I'm going to explain again what we're voting on. We're voting on Ms. Roach's motion Ms. Roach's motion is as printed on the screen. Move that the subject. Excuse me? It, it's just a, it, that doesn't mean anything. That's just like a title. It, we're just voting on the motion. Just take everything out that's above that. It's like a comment. It doesn't mean anything. So here's the motion. Moved that the subject matter of Article 81 be referred to the Nantucket Planning and Economic Development Commission, NPNEDC, for further study, period. That's the motion. It requires a majority vote. A yes vote adopts the motion. A no vote defeats the motion. If the motion is adopted, then we're moving along to whatever our next article is. If the motion is defeated, then we will go back to a discussion of Ms. Rayport's motion on Article 81. Certainly. 
we're start, we're, we'll start over again completely. Anything else? Okay. So, on Ms. Roach's motion, a yes vote will adopt the motion, a no vote will defeat the motion. It's one for yes, two for no. Voting is now open. Voting is now closed. On Ms. Roach's motion, yes, 188, no, 172, that motion is adopted. Okay. So we're going now to Article 82. Article 82 is on page 154. It received a not to adopt recommendation from the Finance Committee. It was called by Ms. Williams. I'm here. There you are. And we are going to have a positive motion. And there you go. Move to authorize the establishment of an ombudsman to mediate disputes before the town of Nantucket that have come to an impasse. Moreover, to mediate complaints against employees of the town of Nantucket, any department of the town of Nantucket, or any board member of a board elected by voters of the town of Nantucket with appropriate, could you take the D off, off appropriate? Yeah. With appropriate redress for the user of the services when it is alleged that wrongdoing or maladministration has occurred. Is that your motion, Ms. Williams? Yes. Is there a second? Motion is made and seconded. Ms. Williams. In 2018 and 2019, this article had a positive vote to be referred to the Government Study Committee for further action. The wording then said to establish a committee. I was told for various legal reasons that was not something that could be put together. Language has been changed to ombudsman, which is someone that other towns use when their citizens find themselves at an impasse with town government. I personally have found myself in a dispute with the town that is still unresolved. I entered into a contract with the town only to have them renege on the contract a year after it was signed. After legally being outspent by the town, my issue is still unresolved after six years. The citizens of Nantucket need some place to petition town government for redress of grievance. Please vote yes on this article. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this motion? Are you gonna move the question? No, no. Okay. <laughs> Just check it. Just check it. I, I, I want to I uh, be done and, and over as well, but I, I will say I, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, Miss Williams on this. I, I don't know why this keeps going on and on. Is, don't we want oversight as citizens that we're not like, we have no place to go. But I don't know Teresa's, Miss Williams' uh, issue with the town and whatnot, but it sounds like she's kind of uh, at, a, at a stop somewhere where she's getting stuck in the somewhere. And, and I, you know, I, I didn't intend to speak to this article, but um, I am. I just think it. I, I think that I don't know why we can't hold employees of the town of Nantucket departments anybody accountable. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Hold people accountable. That's what I thought. That's kind of the American way to keep people accountable. So, but I and I, I do uh, 
hope everybody votes for this. And then, uh, thank you. Thank you. Sarah? Uh, yes, Ms. Roach. I mean, Ms. Crono, <laughs> sorry. I'll take it. I'll take it. It's a compliment I know, to me. give you That's a couple of years, another year it's off, right? Late. Um, through you, Sarah, I'd like to ask town council to um, explain what some of the deficiencies are in this article and therefore why the finance committee had a unanimous decision motion not to adopt. Okay. Mr. Giorgio. <clears throat> Madam moderator, um, <clears throat> I've uh, several times now have reviewed um, a petitioned article that is either identical or very similar to the one in the motion that was just made. And in my opinion, it's fatally flawed because um, it's lacking in any kind of uh, sufficient detail as to how this process would work. What does it mean to redress an a grievance? A grievance? Does this ombudsman have the authority to overrule decisions made by officials in the town that are statutory officials at an absolute minimum in order to do this you would need to amend your charter to redistribute the powers and duties of town officials otherwise this um, as written the motion um, is insufficient to accomplish what i believe is the intended purpose Thank you. Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams, 18 Williams Street. Uh, town Council has had several tries at this so that he could write it appropriately, and we've gotten no results from that, unfortunately. So all you have to do is go to YouTube and Google the Board of Selectmen's meeting from 3-11-2020. Fast forward to the last 10 minutes, and you'll find where they talk about an ombudsman and a need for people to have a place to go, and they all unanimously agreed. But still, nothing's been done. That was my Joe Biden. Nothing's been done. Why? Ms. Williams? Am I up? If that's the case that this can't be brought forward, where do I find myself again, year after year, where there's nobody in this town to stand up for me, or where do I go when I have an unresolved issue after I've done my due diligence, acted in good faith with the town, and got screwed? Okay. So seeing no hands, no one at the microphones. We're gonna take a vote on the motion on Article 82. A yes vote will adopt the motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. We're ready to vote. Voting is open. One for yes, two for no. So we have two articles left, 91 and 101. Okay, voting is now closed. On the main motion, yes, 206, no, 126. That motion is adopted. Okay, so Article 91. 91 is on page 159, has a positive recommendation from the Finance Committee. It does require a two-thirds vote. The motion is as printed in the warrant. 
I'll ask for your unanimous consent to waive the reading and recognize Ms. Cronow, Chair of the Finance Committee, for the purpose of making the motion. So moved, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? second. Motion is made and seconded. Mr. Gullickson, you called this? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, Kenneth Gullickson, I am the uh, co-trustee and the attorney for the Joseph E. Arno Nominee Trust, which is the owner of 31 Easy Street, which is the restaurant on the corner of Easy Street and Steamboat Wharf. Um, the town proposes to take that property. That's what Article 91 is about. Um, they've made no effort to purchase it. Uh, we've done extensive research, did not find any instance in which the town took a commercial property by eminent, eminent domain. As far as I can determine, the town has always signed an agreement and purchased properties for a set price, as for example, it's doing with 10 and 12 Washington Street in Article 19. When handled that way, there is an established price, which is not the way it works in a taking. Uh, I think it's important that everybody understand how eminent domain works. The select board votes to take a property, at which point the town owns it, but it has not determined a price because it can't. Um, a pro tanto payment is made, which is just an estimated initial payment based on the select board's estimate of the value of the property. The select board doesn't determine the price. By law, the owner is entitled to be paid fair market value which is determined by a jury. Fair market value in a taking case is defined as the highest price which a hypothetical willing buyer would pay to a hypothetical willing seller in an assumed free and open market considering all uses to which the property is reasonably adapted, whether contemplated by the owner or not, and not just the use to which the property was put as of the taking date. Once the value of the property is determined by the lawsuit, the town must pay the difference between the pro tanto payment and the fair market value. Again, that payment must be made regardless of the amount. The payment can't be avoided if a Proposition 2.5 override fails. The town can't undo the taking and avoid the payment. It has to be made. The intent is reported in the press and clear from Article 92 is for the property to be divided between the town, steamship authority, and the land bank. It's been reported that the town will only keep a small portion of the property. The rest will be conveyed to the steamship authority and land bank, but no plan has been presented. There have been no public hearings, no public input of any kind, so we don't know how, the town, what, how much the town will retain or what it will do with it. The Finance Committee motion suggests that the property will cost $3 million and that $2 million of that will be paid by the Land Bank and the Steamship Authority. Neither the Finance Committee or the Select Board determine the price. Again, it's determined by a jury, but I think we all know, particularly in today's market, that it's worth more than $3 million. If this article passes and the town proceeds, it will have to pay the actual fair market value however much in excess of $3 million that is. If the steamship and land bank reimburse the town for $2 million, that will leave the town to pay the full amount of the excess. That's just the acquisition price. And there'll be studies, plans, construction, maintenance, et cetera, in addition to probably two years of legal fees for the suit to determine the price. If the majority of the land is going to the steamship and the land bank as reported, why not just let them buy it directly? Why authorize the commitment of an unknown amount of town funds? There is nothing to prevent the steamship and land bank from buying it. Same owner, Joseph Arnold, my co-trustee, sold 27 Easy Street to the land bank for its park in 2015 with an interest-free financing. The town would still have input into what's happening through its representative to the steamship authority. You're being asked to authorize the select board to spend millions of dollars without you knowing now or them knowing at the time of the taking how many millions to buy an unknown portion of a property with only a vague notion of how the town's portion will be used. If the select board wants to acquire the property, they should, after it's agreed how the property will be used and divided, provide a plan and an established price for your approval. Then you could make an informed decision. That is not what they have done here and the responsible thing would be to vote no on Article 91. Thank you.
Thank you. Mr. Bogrant, I see you heading towards a mic. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, my name is Ken Bogrand, and, and I'm the real estate specialist for the town. Uh, we've been talking about planning in the previous article, and so I want to use that as a framework for the discussion with respect to this particular article. Uh, the port of entry to Nantucket is the harbor, and at this point in time, it is singularly unattractive. It has major issues with respect to traffic, it has major issues with respect to safety relative to that corner, and it has major issues with respect to various other situations. What Mr. Gullickson has talked to you about is his idea of how this should go forward, and I would like to make a, I, I would like, whoops, sorry, I, I would like to just address some of those concerns. Um, the, the way that this goes forward is that, that on behalf of the town, in terms of long-term planning, we put together an approach to the land bank and the steamship authority saying that this is a property that should be addressed to meet the needs of all three of those organizations with respect to dealing with access to Nantucket's port of entry. So the approach is, is that each of them would, in, in fact, excuse me, each of them, in fact, would, in fact, be able to, uh, to, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, just want to sit down. Yeah. Sorry. So that each, 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 each of those organizations would be able to address their needs relative to what we're trying to do to make that a more attractive entry. So the process that, that would be going forward is, is that we would be going forward with an order to take the property by eminent domain. And what, what is necessary in terms of the process for eminent domain is that there has to be a formal appraisal done. And the appraisal has to be for the best and most attractive use of the property that the appraiser has to, in fact, uh, come forward with an appraisal. So the fact is, is that there's going to be an independent expert that is going to be setting the appraised price that is part of the proposal in terms of moving forward. With respect to the uses of the property for both the land bank the Steamship Authority, and the town, each has their own separate needs. The town has a concern with respect to the corner in terms of cars, trucks, and stuff going around the corner. It has an equally great concern with respect to pedestrians, because any of you who have tried to walk down to the Steamship Authority, that in fact has a situation where you, you're, I'm, I'm okay, thanks, <coughs> has a situation where you either have luggage or you're towing kids along, Walking along that side is really, really very dangerous. So from the town's point of view, we're trying to address the issue of safety. From the Steamship Authority point of view, we're trying to address the issue of access to the area where all of the uh, trucks are coming in, cars are coming in, and the ability to get there and get out. Anybody that meets a boat understands how confused and how problematic that whole traffic is in the area. So that's a second item to be able to identify that. The third is the issue that has been raised by the land bank because we're taking a look at the issue that is coming forward with respect to sea level rise and the issue that is coming forward with respect to coastal resiliency. So those are issues that want to be addressed, which is why the three organizations have come together to say that this is an appropriate thing to move forward. The reason with respect to uh, not having any negotiations uh, relative to purchasing the property directly is that the information has been made very clear that the price that Mr. Arno believes the property is worth is certainly very significantly different from the value of the property that the town and the experts and appraisers have suggested it's worth. And so, obviously, if 
Mr. Gullicks and, and his client are prepared to negotiate with the town relative to do it, to buying it in a reasonable price frame, certainly we were willing to do that. But in fact, we think it's really important to be able to, looking forward for the town to address an issue with respect to coastal resiliency, sea level rise, and to create the opportunity for the major port of entry into this town to be able to deal with traffic and the beauty of attraction coming to Nantucket. So it is our request that you support this article because in fact, what will be going forward is that evaluation as to what the property should be taken for by eminent domain will be determined by a licensed appraiser, and Mr. Gullickson's right, if they disagree with it, they can go to court. But the fact of the matter is, is that you're going to have independent experts that are setting the price with respect to this. Uh, as I said, we'd be willing to discuss and negotiate with him, but in fact, that has not been uh, seemingly a worthwhile exercise based on the information as to his perception of value and the town's perception of value. Thank you very much, and I apologize, I got a little nervous having to sit down, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, on the motion, yes, Mr. Allahan. Yes. To me, eminent domain is just, it's just raw power which should be only used in the last expediency of a democracy. I, want, I would like to hear that there is a good faith negotiation going on. What I do hear is that based on what, this, what the town has heard, they, they don't think it's worthwhile to have the negotiation. Uh, again, eminent domain should be the last thing you do in a democracy unless there's no possible ch chance to avoid it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reed? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, Attorney Arthur Reed, I am co-counsel with Mr. Gullickson for the uh, uh, property owner in this matter. And I would stress, we, we have no issue with the fact that the town and the Steamship Authority and the Land Bank all have legitimate interests in being able to acquire this property. It comes down to the method of acquisition. And uh, as Mr. Gullickson pointed out, the procedure on this, if, the, if an eminent domain taking is made, is that it... Yes, uh, an appraisal is done, a pro tanto award is made by the select board, but then it goes to court uh, for uh, a jury trial, and you roll the dice in a jury trial. Obviously, the evidence will be presented on both sides as to the value of the property, but you don't know. And the way this is structured, the town is holding the bag. Uh, you have a arrangement in advance with the land bank and the steamship authority, as I understand it, for a specific amount of money that they would kick in on the assumed uh, price. But if the town has made the taking, the town is going to be liable for the shortfall in the uh, jury award as against the pro tanto award. And therefore, where you have a situation where the property owner is willing to talk with the town, as is the case here. I think it is extremely imprudent and improper to cast this uh, in the uh, uh, light of an eminent domain taking uh, when uh, that doesn't have to be and shouldn't be, in my opinion, done that way. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Genevieve Harmon. I'm totally against this article. Um, I am against eminent domain. If it is the traffic and the safety, I think we're gonna to have to take um, a look at Highline and take all of that by eminent domain. If the steamship and the um, land bank want this property, I think they should fight it out and we should stay out of it because there is absolutely no dollar sign on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I think we are ready for a vote. A yes vote will adopt the motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. It does require a two-thirds vote. Voting is now open. One for yes, two for no.
Yeah. Or, or just don't tell Bobby. Next thing. Okay, voting is now closed. On the motion, 106 yes, 229 no. That motion is not adopted. Okay, last but not least. One oh one. Article one oh one starts on page one sixty eight, continues to page one sixty nine. There's a positive motion from the Finance Committee. I'll ask for your unanimous consent to waive the reading and recognize the chair of the Finance Committee, Ms. Cronow, for the purpose of making the Finance Committee's motion as printed in the warrant. So, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Uh, this was called by you, I believe, Mr. Reed. But I think what I'm going to do, Mr. Reed, is I'm going to go to Mr. Mr. Holgate and give him his five minutes to introduce it and talk about it, and then I'll come to you. Okay? Yep. All right. Thank Mr. You, Holgate. Thank you, Mrs. Monomarina. Uh, good evening. My name is Steve Holgate. Uh, I'm a resident and current president of the Nantica Hunting Association. Uh, I want to thank everybody for staying until the very bitter end here. Appreciate it. Um, the concept of, I want to go over just a little history so everybody knows where this project has been. The concept of a formal shooting range started back in 2003 when a team of members of the Nantica Hunting Association decided it was time to try to get a formal shooting range established. At that time, the majority of the target shooting had kind of accumulated and concentrated itself in an area east of the airport against the old train trestle embankment. Uh, the shooters would police themselves and occasionally organize cleanups to clean up the area. There was some illegal dumping that would take place there. and. Um, that went on for decades uh, with very little or no complaints. That NHA team decided to choose that site and its surrounding land as the best suitable site to build an official shooting range. The reasons they chose that site was again, the activity was already taking place for decades. It was relatively secluded. It was had close proximity to the airport and the industrial park, which were kind of noisy type uses, so we figured it would blend in and there were no wetlands nearby. So this team felt that that was the best location on the island. In 2004, I sponsored an article at the annual town meeting that was overwhelmingly passed to give authorization to the select board to at least 48 acres of that area. Subsequently, the town issued an RFP. They selected a proposal from the Hunting Association. A lease was written and executed two years later in 2006. In 2009, at the request of the town, the NHA agreed to reduce the leased land from 48 acres down to 27 acres. A renegotiated lease was executed in 2011. Over the course of the lease term, the NHA initiated endangered species studies, noise studies, and designed a site plan and, and uh, range design features. In 2013, a special use permit in the form of a major commercial development permit was issued by the planning board after six hearings unanimously. This permit was challenged in court by an opposition group, and after six years of litigation, the courts upheld the planning board's permit, and the NHA continued to seek the endangered species permit required by the state's National Heritage Endangered Species Program. That brings us to the present day, where that original lease has now run out, and we're here to renew a new lease to keep this project going. Some opposing this project have argued that the project would be unsafe and violate noise bylaws. Safety features satisfied the safety concerns and the courts decided the noise bylaw would not be violated based on multiple live fire studies. And now their argument has shifted to lead contamination of the soil and groundwater. During the planning board permit hearings, the Nantucket Land Council requested detailed information be included in our permit application on, on how to prevent and mitigate against lead using, utilizing best management practices. At subsequent hearings, we submitted a summary that we were going to have an environmental stewardship plan, 
that spelled out groundwater testing and also include details of backstop, back uh, bullet stop that would mitigate against lead and it would uh, catch, retain, and prevent runoff of the lead. And it was all, a lot of the documents referred to or uh, referenced was an uh, Environmental Protection Agency's document called uh, Utilizing Best Management Practices for Lead at Outdoor Shooting Ranges. Um, since we've also now uh, included soil testing. Since the project inception, the shotgun trap range was would always be required to be uh, non-toxic shot only and the use of biodegradable clay targets. So that takes that range out of the uh, possibility of contaminating the soil or water. Despite these lead mitigating features for an outdoor range, the opposition is pushing for an indoor range only. The NHA does not object to an indoor range, but indoor ranges are much more expensive and it is prohibitively expensive to enclose the shotgun range, which was asked, we were asked to do at one point. The NHA has proposed to build indoor ranges as the funds become available. If this project is not allowed to continue, target shooting will continue to take place in scattered areas around the island unsupervised and with no safety or environmental features built in. Through the moderator, I am willing to answer any questions that come up and, uh, and I just hope that you vote yes on Article 101 to keep this very important community project going moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reed. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, Attorney Arthur Reed and I am representing a large number of property owners who are near neighbors of uh, this project, mainly in the Russell's Way area. And they've been concerned about this for many years, as, as indicated. Uh, we are, they're concerned for many reasons, but among them certainly are the potential contamination of the environment uh, at a time when the town is now facing the issues of PFAs over by the airport. Uh, here we have another situation where potential damage to the environment uh, can be uh, taking place, and I don't think we want to repeat that uh, uh, exercise. Uh, Shooting ranges are often uh, the subject of litigation throughout the country, and uh, the, uh, uh, in uh, most of those cases, environmental contamination becomes a major issue. And again, I think that that needs to be carefully considered before we go forward with this uh, project. My clients have actually reached out on a number of occasions to uh, uh, my friend, Mr. Holgate, and uh, attempted to uh, establish some dialogue with him, but uh, so far that has not uh, taken place. That's been rebuffed by the proponents of this uh, article. Now, in the course of doing this, I did some research, and the property was acquired by the county uh, in uh, 1998, and uh, then subsequently conveyed to the town. And when the county acquired it, I've obtained the minutes of the meeting. And at that meeting, uh, at a public hearing of the county commissioners, uh, the vote was that the property should be acquired by the uh, county uh, because it is a large open space located adjacent to the airport and its acquisition will enhance the safe operation of the airport for the benefit of the general public. The taking took place with uh, a, a finding of uniqueness made by the uh, uh, county commissioners to that same effect. And the property then was conveyed to the town by the county commissioners. Under those circumstances, it's my opinion that Article 97 of the uh, amendments to the Massachusetts Constitution uh, protecting open space from being converted to another use or conveyed uh, without a two-thirds roll call vote of both houses of the state legislature um, is applicable to this situation. I know that the uh, town has obtained a contrary opinion from uh, town council, and that's an opinion, and what I'm stating is an opinion, but in the final analysis, the only way to resolve that is in a court of law. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Up there in the back. 
Thanks. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I would like to propose an amendment if, uh, to this Could motion. you I identify? Steve Kohler, sorry. Okay. I'd like to propose an amendment to this uh, motion, and it's just to add the term indoor to the construction, maintenance, and operation of an indoor shooting recreational facility. I think that with all the environmental concerns that are out there, local fauna and flora, uh, lead contamination of the aquifer, we don't want another PFAS fiasco on our hands again. The select board has endorsed an indoor shooting range. I think uh, that that is a reasonable compromise uh, between people who are okay with the range but are concerned with the environmental impact. Okay, so is, is that your motion, the addition of that word and indoor? Correct. Okay, is there a second? Motion is made and seconded. Okay, so on Dr. Kohler's motion. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is David Bold. Uh, I plan to speak on the original motion, but I'll st speak on this one for the moment. Um, the addition of making this a, an indoor range requirement is a poison pill to shoot this project down. Uh, the requirement of an indoor range is ex prohibitively expensive, even for just a pistol range. Never mind one that's large enough to uh, handle a rifle shooting. Never mind an indoor trap field. I've never even actually even heard of an indoor trap field ever being created. So this proposed amendment is simply a poison pill to stop this project. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I would like, uh, Ray DaCosta, uh, I would like to just say, an indoor-only shooting facility with concerns of lead contamination and PFOS is outright lunacy. We are still hunting every day with the same shot all over Nantucket. It has been happening for hundreds of years. We are all going to continue to shoot clay pigeons and trap with the same steel shot. It is steel, not lead. It's this, we use lead weights in ponds for pond fishing. Everyone calm down a little bit about this. Give us a range so we can take the just unanimous shooting that is done on this island and put it in one safe place where we can all come together and help teach firearm safety to the entire community. That's literally all this is for. It's not gonna contaminate the aquifer. We're still doing this whether we get it or not. This puts it in one place and allows us to manage it properly and keep it clean. That road down there on Magasham Valley was a shooting range when I was a young kid and long before. It continues to be a shooting range. We do not have the police enforcement to find every single person who decides I wanna take my gun out and shoot a couple targets today. You are making a mistake chasing after lead poisoning and PFOS with this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Engelborg? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Many people in this community know that I'm involved in environmental conservation, but I speak to you today as a hunter. I think the idea of an indoor facility only is really not feasible. Uh, as in addition to what's been mentioned before, another long-standing use of firearms here is black powder hunting. To have a black powder indoor facility I don't think there's a black powder indoor shooting range anywhere in the entire world. I don't think there's an indoor uh, shotgun trap or any indoor shotgun range that I know of anywhere in Massachusetts. So uh, w and, uh, although I agree with the idea of having a pistol range inside, potentially a rifle range inside if the, um, the, the people who put this out to bid can afford it, having a rifle range inside is very expensive so I think that there are ways that we can put into place best management, practice, best, best management practices to clean up lead, to concentrate activities on the site, and to provide a safe, legal place for people to, to um, practice a tradition and a hobby that they're legally able to. So I would urge you to take out indoor. I would urge you to vote for this article and I would 
urge the town and the select board to move forward with the RFP process and make their decisions as they need to. The last thing I'll say is that there are alternatives to lead shot. They are expensive, they are difficult to obtain, but there are ways to restrict the project if it needs to be to have lead-free shot. I'd rather see that than an indoor-only facility. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, up at this other microphone. Yes. Hi, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, if you could say, state your name for um, the record. I'm sorry, my name is Georgiana Alphahel. Uh, so on the contamination thing, my only defense would be, uh, I don't know when the last time you guys went to some of the further away beaches, but it's full of ammo and people get drunk and shoot on the beach. Uh, not great for people shooting, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but a shooting range would be a safe place for everyone to go. They would know about it instead of being like, hey, let's get shit-faced, excuse me, I'm so sorry. Let's get drunk and go to the moors and shoot where maybe there's teenagers walking around or dogs. Um, there's a safe place for them to go. And it's contamination. If it was contamination, it's mid-island rather than into the ocean. People are literally shooting lead bullets into the ocean daily. Almost daily, I don't know, but quite a bit. I've seen it done enough times to be concerned about it myself, so I would vote yes on the shooting range. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is Jerry Horton. I live out in Ed Bridge Lane out in Fisher's Landing. Uh, many of us are very concerned about lead, uh, lead dust, lead pipes, lead paint, lead leached in the groundwater, lead in our water supply, but I too breathe the air and I drink the water. Um, and so do we all. We should take every reasonable precaution to minimize our exposure. The proposed archery and shooting park will not add to lead exposure. Trap and sheet, uh, uh, sh uh, skeet shooting will be restricted to non-toxic shot, that is, no lead. At the pistol and rifle ranges where the lead projectiles may be used, the ranges will be designed built and operated following the suggestions of the United States, uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency in its report, Best Management Pro uh, Practices for Lead at Outdoor Shooting Ranges. 103 pages and I've read them all. This report is available online and is referenced in the proposal to the select board by the Nantucket Hunting Association. It's there for anybody to read. The EPA lists four major steps, control and contain, prevent migration, remove and recycle, document your actions, that is keep track of it all. The Nantucket Hunting Association embraces these best management practices. The shooting park will capture projectiles in an engineered berm or backstop. I got a picture of what we're gonna do right here. 20 feet tall, about 20 feet wide. Lead migration will be prevented by choice of burn material, soil pH adjustment, and runoff control. Projectiles will be sifted from the berm, and the reclaimed lead will be recycled. It won't get out. If you're worried about runoff, it's not going to get out there. The NHA will keep records on all of this. I'm speaking as a registered professional chemical engineer. These things work. I'm confident that these actions will minimize our exposure to lead, and I encourage a yes vote on Article 101 without the indoor restriction. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Okay, so on the amendment, Ms. Um, Molden. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Emily Molden for the Nantucket Land Council. As Mr. Holgate mentioned, the Land Council had advocated throughout the permitting process for the incorporation of these best management practices and additional monitoring and testing of water and soil for contamination. In more recent months, as the select board has reviewed the RFP, they have incorporated some of those measures, many of those measures into the, into the request for proposals and that process, which is certainly appreciated. But the Land Council has still advocated for an indoor facility, not arguing it as a community need or not, and recognizing that that may not satisfy all aspects of the need, but as a way to 
eliminate potential for contamination, we are advocating for a uh, requirement for an indoor facility. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Erica Mooney. Um, I just wanted to make two points. The select board issued an RFP for the shooting range. One of the requirements was not to make it an indoor range. I believe that was a, um, it would be an advantage if you had an indoor range, but it wasn't a requirement. And I also feel that the in addition of indoor is another way that the opponents are trying to squash this range and have done so for many years. Um, they were unsuccessful in court, and so now they're just trying to scare the voters with another tactic. Um, we've been voting on this for years. I feel really strongly that we need a safe indoor, I mean a safe place, not an indoor place, um, so that people can go and shoot their guns and train and um, have target practice. And I would rather them go here than go on trails and find bullets um, spent cartridges with my kids, um, I just think this, this is a no-brainer and I would urge you to shoot down the amendment for an indoor and to, um, <laughs> no pen intended, I swear. Um, <laughs> I know, it's late. Um, and, and to vote for the um, positive motion as proposed by Mr. Holgate, thank you. Ms. Snell? Moderator. Madam Moderator, I'd like to move the question. Oh, okay. Um, Ms. Snell has moved the question. Can we just go to a vote, do you think? Do we have to? Oh, we're, yeah, we're moving the question on, the, on, the, on, that, on that amendment. But can we just go to a vote on the amendment? Do we have to vote on the motion to move the question? I will if you want me to. No. Okay. All right, so we're going to vote on Dr. Kohler's amendment, which is to add the words and indoor so that it would read operation of an indoor recreational shooting range. Um, we're ready to vote. This requires a majority vote. A yes vote will adopt the amendment. A no vote will defeat the amendment. Voting is now open. It's one for yes and two for no. Voting is now closed. On the amendment, yes, 40, no, 299. That motion is not adopted. So now we're back on the main motion as made by the Finance Committee as printed in the warrant. Uh, Mr. DaCosta? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, a little history. I grew up here. We used to actually bring guns and leave them in the school here when we went hunting before school. But there were, before this shooting range was proposed, there were actually two other shooting ranges on the island that where we shot skeet and trap for long periods of time. One was on the bluff in the Navy base when it was a Navy base, and hundreds of thousands of rounds of lead and clay pigeons went off that bluff into the beach in the water behind there. It was later, uh, when the Navy base shut down, we built a range on the Wawenna Road where the, where the uh, parking lot now is for the, uh, the Hidden Forest Walkway. As long as Mrs. Backus was alive and when she died and hand gave the, the property away, we, we took it down. But that was there for at least 10 years when we shot there. Mm -hmm. You have more lead leaching off of your roof from the flashing on your chimneys and your shingles and you'll get from this ground, from groundwater contamination from the shooting range because this will actually be contained, sifted, and removed on a regular basis. Right now you've got people, I'm one of them, shooting all over the island wherever they feel like they can find a spot, and that stuff just sits in the ground. This is a smart thing to do. It will confine it all to one place. It'll be safe. 
It will be monitored. There will be range officers there at all times. You're not just going to be able to show up there and start shooting at 2 in the morning. There will be hours of operation. This is a, something we've been trying to do for a long time, and a handful of people have tried to stop it. I urge everyone in this room to vote yes on this, and let's get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reinhardt, are you looking to be recognized? Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Whoops. No. It must have gotten turned off, maybe? Battery died. Here comes Jason to the rescue. Great. Long Thank night, you. short batteries. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I'm Alan Reinhardt. Uh, I've been the ranger for the Nantucket Conservation Foundation for the last 32 years. And I'm quite familiar with the site. Um, I used to, uh, you could actually drive down to the railroad bed that was the backstop for the lead or for the bullets that were going in. And also for the trash that accumulated back there. Um, the issue is there are 27 acres of public land. The town owns this property. It is public land. There are some beautiful trails in there. It's a wonderful place to go walking. And it seems to me that there's a higher and better use for 27 acres of what I would consider prime land than to have a shooting range to create essentially a public nuisance. Um, you can hear the gunfire miles away from the site. If they're shooting outside, uh, it, it just it makes no sense. It just, you just don't want to walk in that area. Um, so it seems as though the town can find a better use for 27 acres of what I consider to be prime real estate on Nantucket. There are a number of other uses. They could move, uh, they could expand the um, industrial park as they did with Miles Reese. Uh, get, maybe get some of the businesses that are inappropriately in town out near the, the range. Anyway, uh, in short, um, I urge you to vote against this item, creating a public nuisance on public property. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, up in the back. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, my name is David Bold again, and I'm speaking in support of this article. Um, this island is more than 50% open space, dedicating 27 acres to a shooting sport area. Um, it seems like a great use of that space to me. Um, island residents need a dedicated place for target shooting. Target shooting is a great activity that many men, women, and families enjoy. In fact, I met my wife at a shooting range. Um, we need a range, one that is purpose-built with safety of the shooters and non-shooters alike. One that is purpose-built to manage the impact that it has on the environment. Today, an islander who wants to go target shooting either goes off island and the expenses and logistics that go with it, or they find the random open space on the island to shoot at, potentially competing with other islanders who are out for a nature walk and left to manage the safety and environment concerns on their own. The shooting park will provide a great solution a purpose-built facility that manages safety and environmental impacts. It concentrates shooting activity in one place, minimizing the potential interactions out in the moors or anywhere on the island for that matter. My background, I'm a firearms instructor. I'm the person you see when you need to get your certificate to get your license to carry here on the island. I can tell you there are more and more new gun owners every day and they need a place to go. Um, I have experience in helping operate ranges. I've written environmental stewardship plans before. I've been to the workshops. I'm very familiar with the EPA's best management practice document. And I can tell you that the shooting park 
has a great plan to manage the environment. It's one of the best, most comprehensive plans that I've actually ever seen. It addresses all the concerns that have been ra raised, safety, environment. Um, their plan to use only non-toxic shot on the shotgun area completely eliminates the concern of lead in the environment. And the way they're planning to build the rifle and pistol berms eliminates that as well. Even if you're an anti-gun person, this in shooting park benefits you because there is a dedicated place for that activity that doesn't compete with you for the rest of the open space that's on the island. I Thank encourage you. everybody to vote for this article. Thank you. The gentleman behind you, go ahead. Um, Dan Flanagan, uh, I, Madam Moderator, thank you. I move the question. Oh, you're moving the question. Okay. We're just gonna, we're just gonna vote on this. We're not gonna do the motion to move the question. You guys are ready to vote? Yes. You probably wanna go home. I don't know why, but I think you do. So, okay. On Article 101, the motion is as printed in the Finance Committee and made by Ms. Cronow. A yes vote will adopt the motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. It does require uh, a majority vote. Voting is now open. One for yes, two for no. Now, I know you're all voting and leaving. I just want to remind you that things can happen. So it's better to wait. It's just better to wait. I don't want to get all the calls tomorrow uh, that something tricky happened. Voting is now closed on our penultimate vote. It's yes, 307, no, 32. That motion is adopted. I would like to recognize Jason Bridges, chair of the Select board for the purpose of making a final motion. Motion to dissolve, so moved. Is there a second? Motion made and seconded. I'm gonna say that's unanimous. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the people you see their names zipping by.